Okay. Ancient Mahara here. Well, this is like a third rail of BPD to speak about, so to speak. <clears throat> but let me just start off by saying, not all people with BPD are the same. I'm not here to vilify people with BPD. I'm just here to tell the truth, keep it real, to help people heal. <clears throat> so I saw this question, which has nothing to do with my topic here, exactly, but does trauma cause borderline personality disorder? To which the answer was trauma is the injury that the nervous system suffers from after experiencing an extremely stressful event or events and after finding it difficult to survive without altering the normal functioning of the system. So this is like, could happen to an infant, biological level, preverbal, precognitive. And this is why it's not a mental illness, but anyway. So this injury means basically an imbalance in the regulation of the autonomic, um, autonomic nervous system. I sometimes don't say autonomic. Yeah, okay, whatever. So BP has been kind of defined amongst all other things that, that quote, define it, unquote, as being an autonomic, auton I'm not saying that right, autonomic, sorry, <laughs> autonomic dysregulation disorder, so autonomic nervous system. And Marsha Lunahan, really her, her model is the biosocial model. And BP is conceptualized within that model as emotion dysregulation disorder with four components. Emotion sensitivity, heightened and labile, labile negative effect, deficit of appropriate regulation strategies, and a surplus of maladaptive regulation strategies, which is, you know, the strategies, the inability to cope, to regulate emotion comes not only from the fact that this is a trauma-based issue, not mental health issue, just issue, trauma-based, um, that there's maladaptive coping strategies, and so that makes everything maladaptive in adulthood. And so, you know, as I've said before, you know, borderline personality is considered a disorganized attachment style. Um, and that's, uh, that happens in early childhood because what, if, what you know, in 75%, because what the child is experiencing, the infant, is, is like not being sure, not feeling safe. Is, is mother or caregiver reliable or not? And of course, this is where the big split happens. And, and then the, the external split becomes an internal split that then gets externalized. Causes the emotional rest of development, means that the frag, there's a fragmentation in ego, not like dissociative identity disorder, but fragmentation of the child ego state away from that. So loss of self. So it, it, BPD is an attachment issue, an attachment trauma. And this injury causes, you know, people to be fearing abandonment, have rejection sensitivity, initially from mother or parents, but, you know, then this gets internalized and, and it's shame and it's all kinds of woundedness. And there's no way for somebody to learn how to regulate anything, model anything, know who they are, or anything in this. So, and I have, I have been mostly talking on my own, but there's a quote. I quoted a couple of uh, places of things, so I'll tell you where it is in a minute. And then um, I'm quoting here. I don't think it's semantics. Uh, this is an author, professional quoting. I think that as soon as attachment trauma gets recognized officially, see now, how come that's not recognized officially? By whom? Are we always waiting on the stupid pseudoscience of frickin' psychiatry? Ugh. Because so many therapists know this already, right? Including the one I'm quoting. Um, so as soon as the uh, attachment trauma gets recognized officially, BPD will be also recognized as a, well, I don't think we have to say disorder, but rooted in an attachment injury. 
So as opposed to the quote genetic predisposition that they would be, a, okay, so end quote for what I was quoting, um, that they're espousing now, which they can't prove, and which is really like not much, if anything, to do with the whole picture. And then um, we we could turn this around and say it a different way, that um, if there was any genetic predisposition, it's triggered by attachment trauma. So where I quoted part of that and spoke in between um, from Cora, oh, geez, I hope I get her name right. This this I love this professional's answers to things. Antoinetta Contieras. Um, she's a psychotherapist, trauma, neurofeedback, uh, in, specializing in neurofeedback and EMDR. So there, there you have it, because I wanted to quote somebody because people think I'm just making this stuff up or just saying it because I feel like saying it. So a couple of things I want to say here, and like if people have questions or anything, that would be great. Or if you want to share your experiences. Um, Oh, hey there, Jess. A uh, new subscriber. Welcome. Uh, thank you for that. Um, hey there, Spica. Yes, you're still in Paraguay. Greetings. Yes. And Melody, um, these videos have helped me over the last year tremendously. Thank you. You're welcome. So this one, not going to be popular with people with BPD unless they're aware or unless they're not um, the type of people with BPD or people that manifest BPD and really, uh, well, I think everybody with BPD abuses to some extent, but exploitation, punishment, and revenge. And just before I go there, um, because, you know, I'm going to keep it real, even though when I do videos like this, I get these nasty emails and comments. People go, well, you're talking about yourself, you know, you know like if I mention exploit, well, apparently I'm exploiting all of you, don't you know? Anyway, I'm not. Um, but what, so what's the difference? Here's a question people like to have an answer to. I don't have the absolute, but I think it's a pretty good answer. And, you know, I, I am here with the interest of forwarding accurate information because there's more people online ever before than ever before espousing a lot of really crap and people are just eating it up like it's real information. Not to my problem though, but so are there differences between abusers with narcissistic personality disorder and abusers with borderline personality and I eh, disorder, whatever. Okay. Well, you know, the first sort of stated obviousness would be, or obvious thing to state is, well, they're both in cluster B for what that's worth. And there are some overlaps, but there are differences. So, um, Emotional abuse and manipulation uh, can be perpetrated and in different ways, though, by narcissists or people with BPD. And uh, let me see here. So the, the one of the major differences between narcissistic abuse and BPD abuse, which is technically, quote, narcissistic abuse, but not the same thing just the origins in the literature of how these things are actually defined, a major difference is often, not always, but the intent. And then, again, we have to say people with BPD have the capacity for empathy, though empathy doesn't usually cross over when they're in an, a state of abusing someone or traumatizing someone. Even, well, you know, here's the irony, right? People with BPD in the 75% experience attachment trauma and or other trauma very early in life. And then, of course, accruing trauma often in childhoods and, you know, all the way through with dysfunctional, you know, narcissistic, cluster B, whatever, dysfunctional families of origin. So this is the, like, tragic irony of it all, that they get abused they get tremendously wounded. And then if they don't seek treatment for that by adulthood, if they don't start getting help, they can't help but externalize out in repetition compulsion fashion, which can be really subconscious or unconscious behavior. So there's a difference often between narcissists and people with BPD is that 
their intent isn't the same. But, you know, if you're getting abused, does that really matter? I don't know, because I would think it doesn't. But so, yeah, this tragic irony, people with BPD get abused and they suffer greatly. And then they're trying to relate to others, but everything triggers them back to their abuse. If they don't, you know, really get treated to recovery, which is possible and, and treats, it triggers them back to their abuse. And then in a reactionary, uh, overcompensatory, super defensive, emotionally dysregulated, not always age regressed, but sometimes age regressed way, they then externalize out what they've taken, you know, the abuse not only they suffered, but the interject of the negativity of the abuser that was abusing them, and that comes flying out of them and at you, because you're always going to be the abusive, well, uh, often when people are really abusive with BPD and in those triggered or splitting to devaluation times, you are that object of their parent representation subconscious, uh, unconsciously on their part, but it's just like this automatic, horrific, protective thing that they do that abuses other people. And I'm going to say, too, that BPD abuse is not always that innocent. I'm going to get into that. I'm going to get into there can be malice. There can be forethought, especially when you put BPD comorbid with NPD together in some people. But even within BPD, as I did a video or, you know, sometime this week, there's grandiosity. There is some amount, there can be an amount of grandization, but it's not the same as the level of narcissistic personality disorder. So I was just going to say here that um, it's important to say that not all people with BPD or even all narcissists really are abusive. Is there going to be some emotional abuse kind of tacitly involved? Maybe, but they're not all as abusive or acting out and and yes, people with BPD, this is more severely affected and be like not the majority of people with BPD, but there is a percentage of people with BPD that can have almost as predatory a nature in punishment and revenge and abuse and exploitation as a narcissist. And then, of course, there are those who have BPD, NPD comorbid, in which case it's kind of a back and forth, but often the NPD will will be the most, uh, will be in the lead, so to speak, in the way that they're really going to come at you and, and defend themselves. And in the way that the, you know, the ego is wounded and rewounded. So, you know, it can be verbal abuse, it can be all kinds of different abuse. And I've seen it said out there by professionals and, and, and others that the ma that a major difference between narcissists and borderlines is that narcissists will always be hurting others <clears throat> and that people with BPD are more likely to self-harm. Well, again, differences of individuals because a lot of people with BPD are more likely to self-harm, but it doesn't mean they're not emotionally abusive or verbally abusive or some degree of abusive when they're triggered to emotional dysregulation. And remember, the triggers lie within them. And so I don't, that's a difference in not all people with BPD are the same more so than I think a major difference between, um, well, it is a difference between MPD and BPD. So, um, and, and people with uh, narcissism, narcissistic personality or narcissistic traits uh, and harming others um, often use things like gaslighting, triangulation, and sabotage as a way to bolster their grandiose image and the false sense of superiority which people with BPD don't do the exact same way, but they can do some of, and in their, and in might look different in BPD, but like if you're being abused, it's not going to look much different. It's going to hurt the same for sure and traumatize you as much. So people with BPD don't often, though they can, as I explained in another video recently, when, when they, when they're in that, they're in repetition compulsion life script, of I'm not okay, basically, is the life position of that life script of that trauma that is borderline personality. And when they want to flip that script because they're really feeling horrible, they're really 
feeling shame. They're, they're just, they can't tolerate all that they're feeling and they get triggered on top of it. Then they can flip that life position in, in their repetition compulsion life script, the trauma life script from I'm not okay, you're okay, to I'm okay, you're not okay. And that's where you can see some borderline grandiosity and them adopting a really false sense of trying to forward to others that they are superior or at least equal, whatever that might mean in terms of whatever they're talking about or whatever they're feeling and reacting to. But that doesn't last and it's not the same as narcissists. So people with BPD obviously have intense fear of abandonment, which is a hallmark of BPD. Narcissists are often the ones doing the abandoning. Well, today, so are a lot of people with BPD. And, and borderlines may engage in chronic manipulation of loved ones using jealousy, control, um, and threats to avoid abandonment. And I would include now, I think today I'd have to say, and threats of they'll abandon you. Uh, they, this is to heighten the risk of being abandoned. Um, yeah, it really only heightens the risk of being abandoned due to clingy, needy, or controlling behaviors. And then narcissists manipulate by devaluing and discarding. Well, I don't see a difference there really. Um, so yeah, I think people with BPD, people can experience when people with BPD are abusing you. You can experience what looks like narcissistic stonewalling, um, with quiet BPD, you're going to get the emotional withdrawal, um, and they feel invalidated. They'll be invalidating you for sure. And then they, yeah, both narcissists and some people with BPD abandon loved ones without giving any sense of closure or explanation, right? So, hmm. In trying to differentiate, there's more likeness than maybe difference. So intent and motivation are probably the biggest difference. But, you know, like a person with BPD, if they're raging, right? So it tends to be more dissociative, stemming from what Lenahan calls, you know, the emotional third degree burns, but that hardly justifies it, right? Might make it understandable, but if they're abusing you, like, so what? Jake, cut that out. He's resource guarding something from the cat. So then I was just going to say, let me see. Um, and, and narcissist rage really stems primarily from their sense of entitlement and grand, grandiosity that they feel has been challenged, right? And, and that's a little bit different between narcissistic personality and borderline personality. And people with BPD have a wider emotional range usually than people with NPD. And they experience a, sem uh, sorry, a similar sense of chronic emptiness and void as narcissists. And, of course, this is individual and hard to compare, you know. Um, and people with BP can, in fact, feel intense. Well, they apparently, you know, could they feel intense loving feelings for their friends, family, and relationship partners? That, I think, is up for debate because I would suggest not until unless a lot of treatment. Um, because when they, because borderlines confuse love or, or, you know, all the emotions they might feel for someone, they, they really mix that up with need often. So I'm not saying they couldn't have a moment with a family member where they really care about them or something, but I don't think it's love or healthy love or adult love or age appropriate love. And they have such rapidly shifting emotions and distorted sense of identity. And narcissists tend to display more of an emotional numbness, but that wouldn't be the, uh, oh boy, covert, well, you know, vulnerable narcissist, inverted closet, whatever term you want to use. And may I just say, well, I'm just at this juncture, that people with quiet BPD are not vulnerable narcissists, okay? I keep hearing that out there. Some may have comorbidity both, but they are not all. Uh, vulnerable narcissists automatically because they have the quiet presentation, internalizing presentation of BPD. And so with narcissists, there's a lot of like their, their sort of, you know, mimicking and imitating emotions of others and their intense emotions tend to be envy and rage, 
which can happen for a lot of people with BPD too when they're triggered. And so the other thing, of course, is, you know, um, people with BPD, well, they might feel love or they might feel just positive emotions towards someone, but that can quickly, right, just revert back into hatred, fear, or disgust for the person. And that is splitting, obviously. And it's incredibly traumatic for people, as I know I don't have to tell people who've experienced it. And then people with BPD really don't get like what your problem is because they don't understand their effect on others unless until they've had significant treatment. And narcissists do this sort of splitting the idealizing, devaluing um, to their victims because it feeds their need for power and control. So that's not why people with BPD are doing it. Again, the difference in intent. So I just wonder if I have a couple other things to add here. Um, yeah, and, and something I saw written in a couple places, so I can't remember the source, though, but this is kind of like a quote, but it's what I say and it's what I stand for. It's commonly assumed that both disorders stem from trauma. That's NPD and BPD. Um, borderlines are often from traumatic childhood experiences, neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Many grow up in invalidating family environments or diagnosed with BPD. So there's still no um, clinical verdict on what causes narcissistic personality disorder, though there certainly are some narcissists who can come from backgrounds of trauma. Well, and there's also the spoiling effect to that too, I think I should add. So sometimes... Um, someone becomes a narcissist because they're aggrandized by a parent. They're spoiled. They can't do any wrong. They're just praised way too much. But usually it's a combination. And some people get the double injury of, uh, because, like if they're going to be diagnosed with NPD or have strong NPD, NPD traits, sorry, they might have one, like a narcissistic parent, and then a parent that's kind of treating the child like they're a saint. And they're the best this, the best that, the most this, the most that. And then um, P. Walker notes that um, sometimes complex PTSD could be misdiagnosed as either NPD or BPD. Well, I got more coming on all that because there's more coming with the ICD-11. There's more coming from other areas of the world uh, because, uh, you know, me and not, not listening to American psychiatry for sure which has permeated North America, unfortunately. Not to anyone's really better, I don't think. So they're looking at whether there's another theory or origin of, of narcissism, that is narcissism, path, well, quote, pathological narcissism. Um, but these are those studies, and, and yeah, like it can be spoiling as well. So again, the difference, major difference is that border, people with BPD have more capacity for empathy than a narcissist. But individually among some people with BPD, not necessarily, you know, it's hard to say. And both borderlines and narcissists have been shown, I love this, on brain scans. I'm just looking at this. I, these are just notes I took. To have deficiencies in areas of the brain related to empathy. And again, whatever they find in the brain of a narcissist or somebody with BPD, remember, it's likely the effect of trauma. And in the case of BPD, for sure, Neuroplasticity in recovery and healing, in engaging treatment and sticking with it through the long haul that it really does involve, can definitely, the brain, you know, can be changed on that level. So that's not a life sentence of BPD either. So I think, you know, um, It's just, it's just interesting because really at the end of the day, um, there are differences, but one other thing would be BPD. Borderlines are more impulsive. Absolutely. Narcissists tend to be more, what's the word I'm looking for? Organized or like targeting. And, um, so people with BPD can be more impulsive and emotionally explosive, even outside of their intimate relationships. With rapidly shifting moods that support the suggestion that disorder might be appropriately, well, yeah, they're calling it emotional dysregulation disorder. I think it's got five or six names now. But narcissists can also be emotionally explosive in their rage due to their need to have 
a false mask, um, a public persona. Some people with BPD, but I don't think, again, it's the same exactly. And um, narcissists have, it, they, it's thought that they have more impulse control. So they're more in control, and then what they do is more calculated. So, but anyway, um, the difficulty lies in people being traumatized and abused, which, like, there's no excuse for, and then wondering, you know, can a person with BPD be this mean or this cruel or this abusive, and then thinking, well, they must have NPD too, but the bad news is that it can be just BPD. And and the ways in which they're exploitative um, can be somewhat rather endless, and... Um, and also, they can really do that in, I don't like applying the word covert to BPD, but there are a certain percentage of people with BPD that will be covertly exploitative and in a way that they they are aware of. So is that then getting into the territory of people with BPD who have NPD traits, or are they then comorbid? It's really hard to say. But people have, you know, people are always trying to figure this stuff out. And I think it's important to point out that if you're being abused, you need to know what you need to know, do for yourself more than trying to figure out, is it this, is it traits of that, is it? But when, when people are being exploitative, they're making use of a situation or treating others, well, un, I was going to say unfairly, but that hardly covers it, but unfairly in order to gain advantage or benefit. Or, you know, it's a, quote, me, 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 unquote, move, isn't it, you know? And exploit, exploitation is maltreatment of others in order to benefit from their work. Exploitive relationships consist of one party taking advantage of another, using an imbalance of power to control another, or, yeah, to, to try to benefit somehow from their vulnerabilities. So it's only then appropriate to say here in a different way and not meaning the same thing that some people with codependency can be rather exploitative to somebody with BPD but that would be all unconscious as well and it wouldn't be with the same agenda or with the same intent as people with BPD and so exploitation is also a really selfish act um, like I said of taking advantage right and, um, yeah, pretty much it's taking advantage. But when people are exploitive, yes, they are taking advantage. They're often being very manipulative. And, and they're doing it out of, yeah, they're doing it out of their own trauma. But their neediness knows no bounds, especially if they're undiagnosed, untreated, or not well treated. And, of course, not everybody with BPD is going to be like this, whether they're at ground zero with BP or not. And I think also that exploitation can sometimes be viewed to occur when, um, yeah, it, it's like there has to be a pulling for power imbalance. And people with BPD do that with, when they get triggered and all that, then, then they're back somewhere else dissociatively. But also the grandiosity factor, the overcompensatory defense. But that's not to say that some people with BPD, although then they might be more BPD, NPD, but they can really play these kind of, they're not games, right? But they can play mind games. They're, they can be so manipulative. They can be like trying to make people worry about them, whether that's suicide threats or like suicide threats they don't have any intention of even doing or whatever that, you know, like just so many ways, but exploitation can also just be acting out in general with BPD. What does that really look like? Well, it just looks like them, you know, whatever they might choose to do, like maybe they go away. Maybe they withdraw. Maybe if you don't live together, if it's a friend, if it's a family member or something, some other relationship type, then they can be exploitative by not, you know, by not taking your, maybe they've made a threat in the past or, or recent past or a couple of days ago, or I'm not feeling really great. Or, you know, like they're really mad at you or something. 
and then they won't pick up the answer the phone or text or anything for days and there can be a malice very conscious aware part of that for some people with bpd in this manipulative exploitation that is punishment and that is the seeking of revenge and it is borderline abuse so and you know there's nothing positive or one one can't defend exploitation either so um <clears throat> Yeah, hi there, L and B. Um, Jess, not the BPD, but the spouse at one. What do you think about the high functioning BPD? Well, the high fun, yeah, I mean, the, the, the terminology that keeps, you know, this is like older, but there's more and more all the time. It's, you know, high functioning, I think, was first meant to just mean that somebody with BPD tended to function better in the world or in society, could work go to school, function like that, not that high-functioning BPD has anything to do with them being less borderline, so to speak. So, and high-functioning BPD often goes with the internalizing borderline, not always, but more so, because they have to have a little bit more impulse control because the externalizing borderline usually has very little impulse control and will usually let it go wherever something triggers them or pisses them off or happens, they'll yell and scream and rage. So the high functioning uh, people with BPD are also, they have probably stronger defense mechanisms than what would be the lower, lower functioning borderline. So, and when I had BPD, I was, I was definitely an acting out low functioning borderline, which is lucky because High-functioning BPD is missed by shrinks all day long, just like quiet BPD, because they're looking for that way that I looked, I guess. They're looking for the classically kind of like angry. I wasn't always angry, but when I was in my, you know, teens, childhood teens, early, well, to early 20s for sure. And then I started to learn some about that in therapy. But um, that that sort of classic, just no filter kind of anger and defense, it can happen in a heartbeat. Um, so high functioning really is, they have better defenses, perhaps a little less impulsivity, can often be the quiet borderline that's more high functioning, and they're able to manage in careers and workplaces, but they don't do any better than the low functioning borderline in relationships. Um, Luis, uh, hey there, AJ. Why do they continue to bring up the past, even though they said they would not? Oh, well, wow. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. My ex-wife told my son she would not, and not even a few days later, she starts all over again. Well, because maybe, you know, like may, they don't realize what's happening for them. A lot of it is unconscious. But this trauma that they're carrying around inside of them Something will trigger them, and again, the triggers are inside of them, and then when they get triggered, they have no control, until unless significant therapy and beyond, no control over what what, what I refer to, I wrote an ebook. it's available at ajmahari.com, uh, BPD and Rage, automatic negative protective, I forget what I called it, but it is an automatic response of defense in a partially dissociated state of being triggered to emotional dysregulation. So maybe when they come back to baseline and maybe they have some awareness like, wow, you know, like nah, that was horrible or something, but they don't really take responsibility for it. So then they'll say, and they might really mean it when they say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, or I won't do that again. But what they don't know is they don't have any control over it when they're triggered. So it happens again and again and again. <clears throat> and they continue to bring up the past because they never resolve anything from the past unless until a lot, a lot of therapy. So that's the other issue. When they're triggered, they are their past comes flying into the here and now dissociatively, and they're all up in the past. And then they're going to aim that at the person closest. Um, Jess, uh, to Louise, I'm also curious on your question. Well, there, I hope I answered it at least, you know, to, to somewhat, <laughs> um, Essica, or I'm not sure whether, uh, 
who said, why is it that not every child has experienced a trauma or BPD? And is that not every person who has BPD was traumatized during their childhood? It depends on what the trauma is. It would depend on when it happened, what age, what stage of development. Um, it would depend on if it happened independently from parents and there was a lot of support and, and a lot of help with that. And um, so I would say that most children that are traumatized and have this attachment trauma, um, very few of them would escape not having BPD or at least traits of whatever that difference might mean. Because really we're talking about severity of, you know, and I don't think the way psychiatry talks about it is very helpful. So um, the only other difference there might be, but if, it, if, it's, it's, if it's abuse from the caregiver, the mother, it's, it, I don't think a child escapes without BPD. If in fact they do, it would be, a resi you know, the difference between a sensitive temperament and a more resilient, t resilient temperament. But still, that's hard to say. And then you said, and is it that not every person who has BPD was traumatized during their childhood? Well, right, because there's the 25% of people with BPD who have what psychology calls the good mom, the good enough mom, right? So parents that, that usually aren't cluster B and they do, you know, and they might have many children and one ends up having BPD and all the rest are fine. And the thing of that in the 25%, it's percept, it, there's still something that happens that, that leaves them with insecure attachment. So it, it, it might not be the same attachment trauma as a 75% of those who want to be diagnosed with BPD, but it is the best way it can be explained. It is the perception of abandonment that is traumatizing to an infant, to a young toddler, but this mostly happens in infancy. So even if mom is a good enough mom in the 25%, which is the case because I've worked with many mothers of adult children with BPD in the 25%, what happens is that the sensitive temperament of the child creates a higher threshold of need than even the best average mothering, you know, just reasonable mothering because mothers aren't perfect. That the mother does everything she can and is attentive to the child, but the child's need threshold is higher than that. So then there's a perception of abandonment, and that becomes abandonment trauma via perception and, and sensitive temperament. So it's true, because in the 25%, although sometimes when I've been working with clients who have parents, and they, they really fall into the better parents, and they fall into the 25%, Sometimes, not all, but but a certain percentage of people in the 25% with BPD will have been sexually abused, but not by mom or dad or anybody in the immediate family, but a babysitter or a neighbor. So that's also sometimes in the mix for people in the 25%. <clears throat> and just, you know, to make that plain and clear for me, like so many others, uh, when I had BPD and, went, and the trauma of my childhood, I was sexually abused by both parents and, and a, three other adults, actually. So the point is there that, you know, that's just, you have nothing when that's happening to you. Because if, I mean, not that it's ever not horrific, but if somebody in 25% does get sexually abused by a babysitter, say, at a younger age, or, you know, some other incident in early adolescence or long in adolescence, but they still have the parent support m maybe helps maybe doesn't but when it's actually the parents that are sexually abusing you're kind of like well uh, no the word i was going to say would have been a bad pun um uh db mostly my personal bp externalizes um raging beyond control other times she withdraws isolate to room and cuts any connection would the latter be her internalizing with quiet BPD or is it splitting? Well, I, I would say that mm, that's a really good question. Um, I can relate to that from my past too, that there were times when I would be more ragey and more, you know, defending myself and, and all that. 
And there'd be times when I would just try to get the hell away too. So it just probably dep it depends largely on what the triggers are. And it depends where the person is triggered to in emotional dysregulation. So if she mostly externalizes and, and rage beyond control, but other times it draws, that's probably more of an externalizing um, presentation of borderline personality. But um, so, so that wouldn't really have to do with splitting either. Well, it, 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 not necessarily. It's whatever the driven state of the dysregulated emotion is and whether it causes a flight fight response fight flight sorry or a freeze fawn response so and there can be different reasons why they would have different responses because i know in my when, in my childhood and growing up i often had the fight flight response but there was times and and probably more so from my infancy and younger years where it would have been a total freeze um fawn response because I wouldn't have been able to have a fight flight response. Yeah, I like that name, Car Girl. That's cool. <laughs> um, oh, you're eating dinner, listening. Cool. Um, Northern Pike. Hey there. Hi, AJ. Hope all is well with you. Yeah, everything's great with me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're amazing. Keep smiling. Well, thank you. That's that's very humbling and inspirational. Um, Jess, wow, thank you for your answers, AJ. I feel you're spot on. Well, thank you. I mean, you're welcome, and thank you. MC, hi, AJ. Do you think that the most, um, that most adoptees, adoptees, sorry, who never bonded with their birth mothers end up with BPD? Well, I can't really use the word most, but there is a growing, um, known and for what it's worth studied correlation, not for everyone, but many people that get adopted do end up getting diagnosed with BPD. So that there would be abandonment trauma in that. Maybe not in all cases. It depends on the experience. It depends on age. It depends on the transition and a lot of things. But um yeah, I've had I've I've had clients who are mothers of, of adopted children that, that get um diagnosed with BPD and they adopted that baby at like minutes old. So then it becomes you know, uh, it, it's like a perception thing. Who knows what causes that? Because, but, but if a child is a bit older or if a child, you know, was, was really treated poorly by, by the birth mother before it gets to the adopted parents, that can be the reason too. But, but I think it's a lot of people who get adopted. So, so there can be trauma factors there or when they're adopted really quickly, when they're just born then there could be that predilection to a sensitive temperament. Why do I say that? Well, because neuroscience is rather proving that, you know, like, I mean, obviously when we're conceived, we don't start out with anything in particular, right? And as we're going, so what happens in the womb with mother can make, really makes the difference between, you know, a sensitive temperament or a more resilient temperament. And that has to do with how stressed is a mother when she's carrying the baby. Um, you know, it, it do, does in the case of an adoptive mother, I'm just thinking, let's say there was a mother who, you know, got pregnant, didn't want the kid, knew they were going to give him up for adoption, care, was carrying the child to term, maybe used drugs, maybe drank, maybe was irresponsible, maybe was hostile, maybe was really stressed, all of that stuff sends all, you know, cortisol and all those other, you know, um, I don't like to say the word chemicals, but you know, um, biological, I can't remember the word for it, but, but whatever goes through mother's system, you know, endocrine system and the hormones and all that stuff, uh, and the neurotransmitters goes through the babies as well. So that's, that's something too, that's, um, you know, with it, with people that are adopted, it's hard to say because it could, it could be any number of things, including what I've said, or it could be something else. But I think like there is a correlation between people that are adopted and people getting diagnosed with BPD, but it's not like most at all. Like there's no way to measure what percentage of, because not everybody that gets adopted, you know, ends up having BPD, right? So there's some trauma perceived or attachment difficulty or transitional thing or perception even if a baby is like 
birthed by the birth biological mother and remember who can create the sensitive temperament in the child if she's like really you know stressed a lot and then the adoptive mother gets gets the baby at minutes old then something's already happened in the womb there so um but there's no exact i don't think answer for that um Carl girl um said i do the same thing as dbd db rose's daughter does that's interesting because i wonder what it's like for you to hear about what db rose is saying about her daughter and i think you know so it's hard to say but there's no th this is interesting because it brings up the reality of so many individual differences and a person that might you, you know this idea that externalizing bpd means they're always yelling and screaming that they could never like withdraw is so so maybe that's a misnomer out there because it doesn't always have to be the same reaction and then people with quiet bpd internalizing the, the, i guess the difference with that is that people with quiet some people with quiet bpd can externalize once in a while but if there isn't much or next to none of externalizing then you know it's more of a quiet bpd and when there's externalizing and sometimes withdrawal, it still fits under externalizing. Um, and Northern Pike, I'm sure this is a redundant question. Is it possible to have a friendship with an ex with BPD if you're emotionally detached? Uh, no. I mean, is it possible in all kinds of ways? Yeah. Emotionally, is it healthy? No. Is it wise to consider it? no um and and i did a live stream on that that i don't know it was maybe a week or so old you might want if you didn't see that one you might want to check out parts of that one but um no it's uh it's not really um anything that anybody should do and especially if you've been moving forward and doing well in your life um and some people like you know I, I, every statement i make doesn't mean every single person with bpd is like this but here's the thing for people to think about though with that question it's like after you've gone through what you've gone through, right? And, and and that's for most people abuse and some amount of trauma or other and been very hurt by this person with BPD and feel betrayed. And maybe, you know, it's usually like a trauma bond. Then why would anybody want to look back and think, oh, this person that just broke my heart or shattered me or it did various degrees of what people actually experience from different people with BPD why would anybody want to look back for friendship and and that's something that a lot of people do because they haven't i'm not saying this in your case northern pike but a lot of people do that because they're still hoping to get the relationship back they it, that that's the that's the person with that's codependence responsibility and they're not yet doing uh, i mean if they're actively seeking the friendship with the ex they're not doing their own healing and recovery work to know what's healthiest for them <clears throat> and they haven't really let go yet so and 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 for people that you know if they really consider it after a time and when they're feeling better then maybe they need to remind themselves of how how much work it took to be feeling better from what you're actually feeling from the relationship <clears throat> excuse me anthony m good day yeah, good day to you too. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, for the podcast. So, you know, I, I do yeah, I'm not here to advertise stuff. It's just in case you're interested, right? But I did write an ebook and it is kinda older. I do need to find time to get these other ones finished. But it's called uh Punishment and Revenge and BPD, where I really extensively talk about that. And I have one BPD and Rage, and I have an audio program which is BPD and Rage Addiction. Because it rage for the externalizing borderline becomes an absolute addiction. It's a go-to. It's automatic, and and it re and, and I remember in my recovery how difficult it was to let that go because it's all about protection. Uh, Dominic, hey there. Hi from Croatia. Well, how are you? DB, thank you so much, AJ. I really appreciate your knowledge and experience with BPD. With all the mixed info out there. And with BPD being so traumatic, it is such a relief to find a source I can trust. Well, thank you. 
And I mean, I think <clears throat> there are ever more present people that just, you know, every other word they say about BPD, they, they just screw it up entirely. And there are people out there who say, and they don't even care if they're wrong. Well, like, what is that besides blatant arrogance and probably something else that I shall not name? But the thing is, why wouldn't people, it, this isn't pervasive, but it's out there. Well, I could be wrong. I don't even care if I'm wrong. Then what, what, what really is the motivation that would have somebody talking about this to kind of, quote, help other people uh, and say something like that? Because I would care very much if I'm wrong. And I'm not saying I haven't sometimes made a little error here or there, could have said something better, but I don't come here unprepared. I don't come here with speculation. If I don't really know, or part of the answer I gave before, like about people that are adopted, I wouldn't say most, don't know that if there's stats on that, everything doesn't apply to everybody with BPD, but you know, not, not this nonsense that people with BPD want to be punished and therefore they're all looking for narcissists and then things i've seen written online like people with bp like exes of people with bpd are saying well i if only i could have been more narcissistic then to the sources of information that are giving out this misinformation this absolute claptrap irresponsible nonsense that must feed their egos because it's not doing anyone any good and i think they're probably well aware of that Oh, Anthony, thank you so much for that. That's so kind of you. I super appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'm not, when I, when I talk about this, it's very dicey, you know, because the detractors and the trolls always say, oh, you think you know everything. No, I don't think I know everything, but I do know that I know more than people that just jump online and talk about some experience, whether it's real or imagined, because, you know, I do have that unique and it's nothing to brag about. But I do have that unique 360 angle on BPD because I had two cluster B parents, mother BPD, NPD, father dark triad, lots of relatives that have BPD and other variances of, I mean, other things in cluster B and whatever. A lot of neurosis and crazy people in that family with a few that were grounded. Um, and a lot of them were alcoholic too, by the way. Both my parents are alcoholics on top of everything else. And that's not a woe is me statement. But the thing is, so I had BPD labeled with it, not assessed for it, can look back now, revisionist history would suggest, hmm, like, yes, I had the trauma. So that's the most important thing. But what really drives me crazy when I think about this is the fact that there's more treatment out there now than ever before. There are more people undoubtedly with BPD and NPD these days because there's more trauma in the world than ever before. And, and, and so this is exponentially, if, if there's a real epidemic or pandemic out there, this is it. I don't know what's going on with the rest of the world right now. But trauma to children, and then what happens? It, you know, if it's BPD, which is a trauma response, I say, quote, known as BPD, or if it's NPD, or if it's, uh, you know, many of the other things, and, you know, cluster A, cluster C, can also be trauma responses. I've also been reading up a little bit on ADHD because ADD and ADHD were in fact freaking made up in the DSM-3. They absolutely were to push a medication agenda. But when I say that, people who have been diagnosed with those things now, well, I'm not, you know, and I, and I know somebody now who has ADHD, a professional that I met recently and in my community. So like I would say, yeah, it's something. But when they started off with labeling it, it wasn't anything in particular. But now, um, you know, more and more research is showing that ADHD is likely a result of trauma as well. So the, the core reality of trauma in the human condition, it, it's like, if it, and we can't lump it all together. But if you think of all trauma as being very similar to the trauma of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe needing a little delineation there, then like Pete Walker said in the, in the beginning of his book, quoting somebody else before he walks it back in some areas, if psych, the American, it, American psychiatry would recognize complex post-traumatic stress disorder, their freaking growing Bible of psychi psychiatric nonsense, 
and pathologizing of humanity would be a pamphlet. So see, everything is really, it goes back to trauma. Now, saying that, I don't mean that that gives anybody the license or it's no excuse for abuse. And and the reality is that it's people that are traumatized and were abused that are going to traumatize and abuse. And they need to get treated for that. And maybe some people are beyond that range in PD. I don't know. ASPD, I think, is totally different. I follow the pioneering work of Dr. James Fallon, who himself is a psychopath. He knew he was a malignant narcissist, long story, but in one of his own blind studies where he put his head in the MRI as part of the control group, uh, they had to go undoing all the, you know, triple binding of confidentiality and whose brain is whose brain uh, because they had a psychopath in the control group and they found out it was Dr. James Fallon. And he's written a book about it. But I love his work because he talks about people with, um, and it shouldn't be called any social personality disorder because not a personality disorder. Personality disorder is, uh, those two words are ridiculous, okay? They're just false equivalencies for everything that's going on. But anyway, so with with um, psychopaths and what Dr. James Fallon pioneered is that they're born that way. And if they come into the invalidating, traumatizing environment, that's what makes for the psychopaths that are going to be out there, you know, not only abusing, but killing people. And then, so he calls those antisocial psychopaths. And then he has a category called prosocial which are the ones that, even though they don't take it in, they, they come into a family that is nurturing and loving, in other words, kind, doesn't add to the difficulty of the way that psychopaths are born. And then they be, you know, they're still psychopaths, but they, they become the white collar type CEOs. You know, they, 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 they're not out to, you know, physically abuse and, and do horrible things and or kill people. So you see, if you look at what Dr. James Fallon said, if you look at it that way, there's no need for the word sociopath or sociopathy whatsoever. So it drives me crazy when people use sociopath because it doesn't mean anything. What they're trying to say is delineate between, you know, the predator psychopath and the non-predator psychopath. Though they may predate, have predation but not in a violent way. So that, that's the delineations there. Just a lot of words, and, you know, misleads people. And uh, Dominic, is it's really about the loved ones. As long as we keep the focus on the wrongs of the person with BPD and hold on to resentment, I don't think real healing can take place. We need to focus on ourselves. Well, yes, definitely. And for real healing to take place, you know, often by the time people catch up to what's happening to them, to what's going on. You figure out his BP, whatever the case, or, you, you know, you go with a partner or girlfriend or boyfriend, husband or wife, and you find out and, and they get, you know, assessed and diagnosed with BPD. Then there's usually been too much damage done to consider the relationship viable going forward. And especially if they're not in treatment, because then nothing's going to change. So it really is incumbent upon people and often with codependency to take care of themselves and to detach with love or in other relationship types, significant other chosen relationship types. But some people have to do it in family too. Go no contact, get in your own healing and recovery journey and don't look back. Um, and that's what I did with my family of origin. I went no contact before there was any book saying no contact. And the next thing is that I, um, you know, I needed to get away from them to be able to, like, not continue to be traumatized while trying to recover from the trauma I was trying to recover from. So going no contact from family of origin is often, yeah, the only choice people have. Or from um, a sibling or relative with BPD, sometimes that happens as well, or NPD or ASPD or some other thing, cluster A or cluster C. Um yeah, Anthony, what what that is, DB, is Anthony just donated to me $10. So, which people can do by hitting that little dollar button at the bottom and entering a donation if people want to do that. So that's what that is. Um, and you said to Car Girl, OMG, I feel for you. I'm really wrapped around my daughter's pain. 
But when you say you experience the same, my heart goes out to you. Hey there, JT. Yeah, you, you explained it before I got to it. Yeah, the dollar sign to the right of the text bar it asks people to give. Yes. Um, someday I'm going to come here and say, if you want to ask me questions, it's going to cost you a buck ninety-nine. No, not really. I don't think I'm that desperate. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, I really appreciate donations when, when anybody wants to do that. It's very kind. It's obviously only when people want to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I always get a bug in the throat when I'm doing this talking. It's still dry in my world. Um, Anthony, I think I can listen to AJ all day. Um, a wealth of information, and she explains the complex in an easy way to understand. Well, thank you so much for that, Anthony. Um, I'm just, you know, humbled by that. Um, Daniel, hey there. Nice to see you. I've, I've seen lots of your wonderful comments recently, and I'm still trying to catch up to comments, and I hope people can be patient with that because the channel is a growing and it's great to see more interaction. Always welcome people's comments, sharing experience, asking questions, supporting each other. It's fabulous. So I have like, I, I think I spent two and a half hours yesterday just answering comments. It really, but I want to, and I care, and I think it's important. And then sometimes when comments are really long and whatever, like, well, then that's the opportunity. And I have a few comments put aside for they will be videos, you know, and I will do videos to answer them because the answers probably a whole lot of people would benefit from, hopefully, if I can do them justice. <clears throat> and, um, DB, is that, well, you're asking JT, so maybe JT can answer you because it feels a little awkward to me, um, on the donation aspect of things. Um, oh, then you said, oh, never mind, I see now. Oh, okay. MC, my ex of BPD got, oh, yeah, the thing. <clears throat> I'll just call it the thing. Back in February, March, and the last time I spoke to him two weeks ago, he told me that he hasn't fully recovered or felt the same since he's had it. He's gone no contact because, uh, well, you know, I, I don't even know what that thing is. So, you know, did he really have it? Was it convenient? Who knows? I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying there's possibilities to think about there. Um, <clears throat> hey there, Wheels. Good to see you. How are you doing? Uh, DB, I know nobody here. I know nobody here knew. But I was wondering where you are, Wheels. Oh, yeah. You, okay. Um car girl um to db rose thank you and you said i always had chaos in my life started to research long story short ended up here where after a lot of research yeah you found me um to be the best and most on well thank you for that and most honest um mc i can't handle the vicious cycle is it wrong of me to not check in on him no absolutely it isn't because if you can't handle the vicious cycle then you're over limits and boundaries or you need to you still implement, you know, healthier limits and boundaries for yourself. No, um, because, well, this is a bad analogy, but, you know, if if somebody for some reason and treating you really badly in any capacity became more or less like maybe not an enemy, but, you know, somebody that you didn't want to like ever talk to again or something, it would be unfortunate if something happen to them um but would you want to check in on them like i don't think so um and you said i feel like he thinks i should well he might but that's his issue right <clears throat> you should be the one to initiate contact first because i know he's not well well and, and and you know he may well not be well or he may be manipulating i don't know um just saying when you're at a distance you're kind of at a disadvantage to really know what is really really happening because a lot of people, not all, but with BPD, and one of the ways they abuse the most is utter manipulation, and that manipulation often accompanies a whole lot of lying. I'm not saying that's the case there. I couldn't tell you. But, you know, um, people with BPD will often have the expectation that you, because they don't take personal responsibility. So you're responsible to check in, he thinks. You're responsible to initiate contact. You're responsible for everything. But guess what? You're not. 
and and you know first of all take care of yourself and second of all this is a great opportunity you can give him to learn something new should he choose to learn from the fact that you're not just gonna you know be like hoovering around and coddling him because he's responsible for himself and if he is ill then he's responsible for getting the help physically if he's physically ill just like he should go to therapy he's responsible for taking care of that that's why there's hospitals and people out there take care of things like that uh northern pike it amazes me how you keep up with all the comments and stay in context on individual with individual commenters well, sometimes I do, mostly I'm okay with that, but honestly, sometimes I'll just get a line and, and it's usually if I've talked for a little bit on something and then I'll get a line and I'll be like, oh, I have no context for it. So that can happen. Um, Dominic, I'm just coming to terms with codependency, understanding it really makes me feel like I have so much more to feel and live and look forward to feel that self-love that I never um, felt in my life. Yes, well, and, and that is a process that can have some pain to it and some grief, but it is so rewarding and it will be wonderful when you really, as you say, look forward to when you get to feeling the self-love that you've never felt in your life. So I'm really glad that you're taking care of yourself. And um, And Will said, yeah, trying to recover while still being traumatized is a struggle. It's like trying to keep a boat with a hole in the bottom uh, dry and afloat. Yes, it's that constant. It's like whack-a-mole, isn't it, you know, uh, unfortunately. And so let's see, what else can I say about... Um, so do I know some of what I'm talking about now? I don't think I was really ever exploitative, actually, to tell you the truth, uh, by itself and what it means. But was I manipulative when I had BPD? Oh, yeah. Did I always know why? No. Did I sometimes? Yeah. Uh, did I want punishment at, at times when I had BPD? Oh, yeah. Did I seek revenge? Well, I, I never, I never like, you know, first of all, I didn't ghost anybody. Second of all, I didn't um, have a bunch of relationships one after the other. Like the person I had was 13 years long. Um, with a quiet BP, by the way. Um, but anyway, um, so <clears throat> I'm going to say more about that in a minute because another thing I want to say that's out there, really rampant misinformation that just needs somebody else to say something different about it, is that when two people with BP are in a relationship, whether it's externalizing BP with a quiet BPD or two externalizing BPDs, which you wouldn't want to be the neighbor because that'll be a lot of noise, you know, yelling and screaming at each other. But it's been said out there so irresponsibly and so erroneously that if two people with BPD are in a relationship together, one of them has to take on the role of the narcissist. Because somebody, a couple people out there think, and there's massive projection happening here, right? I'm trying to be as vague as I can and I'm not doing a good job. These couple people out there saying this kind of absolute nonsense are actually projecting themselves when 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 they're saying that people with BPD want to be punished and, and therefore the, the only person they'll stay with or stay with longer is a narcissist, which is abjectly ridiculous. I mean, people with BPD do get with some people with NPD, but it's repetition, compulsion cycles of they likely had a narcissistic parent. and And so, you know... This, this idea that two people in a relationship, both having BPD, one would have to be more like the narcissist or become a narcissist, it's abject nonsense. Where did that come from in my head just now? I have no clue. Um, where was I? Um, yeah, so I think what I was just going to say, too, is... Um, <clears throat> wheels wishes it was a person with bpd but i'll let wheels answer you uh dominic i think um you know so this idea because a lot of people with bpd well not everybody's the same but in the emotional realm i think it's pretty safe to say that most people with bpd have abused somebody at some point or other whether consciously or not so and and then we see the narrative out there that these people think they're empaths. So
So they're not all in the same place or whatever. But borderline abuse is real. And whenever I've talked about it or written about it online before, it usually gets quite a reaction. You know, the reaction I'm not looking for is I'm talking about it to help people who are being traumatized by somebody with BPD or exploited and or abused and exploited. But And punishment and revenge, not everybody with BPD will be after punishment and revenge. And, and that has many different looks and feels to it and many different motivations for it as well. So, um, and, and, you know, I mean, a lot of it is still externalizing, um, or yeah, externalizing what they are still unaware of is their own experience. So, so they want to go punish a friend or an ex friend or a significant other or an ex because they want to punish the original wounding parent. Sometimes it's not that innocent or subconscious, like it's not innocent, but sometimes it's not that subconscious. So. And the people with BPD play head games? Yeah, sure. I mean, maybe not every single one of them, but, like, I don't know who's walking around up there all squeaky clean with BPD, and this doesn't happen in some way or other. And, of course, some can be very violent. Some can be very physically abusive. And a smaller percentage, again, of people with BPD not only abuse, exploit, and they want punishment and revenge, they punish, they they are predator-like in terms of the danger level of the violence that they're capable of. So that's a lower percentage of women, higher percentage of men with BPD, but not only just limited to one gender or the other. Um, well, it's okay. You guys are having a totally parallel conversation. But I wonder if anybody, you know, Hopefully people will listen back and find this topic important because I think there isn't enough said about this out there. And more and more, like I've said, whether it's treatment centers in the U.S. websites, which, you know, they're they're imparting information. So many places, though, don't just talk about the brass tacks reality of BPD abuse and the cycles of that abuse. And I could explain it six ways to Sunday all day long, you know, day after day. But the bottom line is what's really important for most people who know that they've been abused by somebody with BPD is what are you going to do about getting yourself out of there? Because that's the codependence nightmare. That's the codependence dilemma. Because many people with codependency will take all that, all the abuse that, that somebody with BPD can give, even the worst of the worst, and still think somehow the person that they thought this person was, who they fell in love with, that they can still find that person again. No matter how much they've been punished, exploited, manipulated, or how much revenge seeking. And often people will experience from people with BPD who are exes, or it can happen with family members too, and maybe, I don't know, about, but, but probably any relationship type. They will experience, you know, well... Hoovers that turn into stalking, that's dangerous. When anything goes from Hoovers to you ask them to leave you alone and or you call the police once or twice, you're now into stalking territory. And I, I mean, when I had BPD, I never stalked. I never Hoovered. Not everybody does. But the ones that will engage in that behavior to the point of stalking, and, and if you met in the same local area and you live in the same city or area, they show up at your door unwanted. They show up at your work unwanted. That's stalking and harassment, and, and it's a case. It's time to call the police. But a lot of people with codependency let it go, let it go, let it go. And some people more than others are in a lot of danger and don't even realize it. <clears throat> and I don't want to overblow that because that's not the majority of people with BPD. But again... If somebody makes certain threats, has done something violent, that kind of thing, then in the breakup phase and after is going to be the most dangerous in general, and nobody can predict what they will or won't do. Um, Wheels, is DBT the only thing they use for BPD now? Well, no, not really, except it's rather been, um, I, was, I don't know, I, the word I was going to say, 
like factor it probably isn't a word it's kind of like it, it, it it's a helpful methodology for many with bp but guess what a lot of people bp hate it and they won't engage it so then it doesn't help them but no it's not the only treatment but it's it's effective for some things like people that are suicidal with bpd or really self-harming and that kind of thing they can really be back brought back from the precipice of that can be extremely helpful for that and more and and learning some coping skills but it doesn't really address the underlying trauma that still needs to be healed from which is best done in a psychodynamic modality so what i think is happening is that dbt because it has such initial effectiveness but it's not enough to change a relationship in a year or two i'll tell you that much because there's symptom management they can get better at some things they can learn a lot but they're still going to be struggling with the symptom management because they still don't know who they are and all those emotional drivers of defense that are primal are still going to be very very active but dbt is being what what's happening is more people are getting trained in it and and i think linehan has more of a uh, uh, the video i saw i think it was from 3 years ago uh you know a week ago or so but she was talking about you know the stuff and, and she was saying that people are out there saying they're dbt therapists but they don't meet the criteria for it. so so now they have all this governing body all over that great but what i think is that more people are going into it okay so that's probably positive overall but more people are going into dbt then say psychodynamic therapy uh modality practices or or learning about them and and becoming proficient with them and also it's it's kind of put out there it could be really effective it has different efficacy for different people with bpd but a lot might not change much at all or they'll drop out <clears throat> or they'll only get into a 6 month kind of dbt program a- instead of a year but even after a year some people want to do it again some people have done it multiple times and the point is it's i don't know how to put this um it has efficacy but i think more and more agencies and institutions are looking at that as a sort of like a factory model if it, i just don't know any other way to put it a factory model of how to hopefully get these people in help them somewhat and get them out because there's so many people that need treatment like these dbt programs i know in the area where i live they can have 3 to 5 year wait lists and so you know what happens to a lot of people with bpd in the meantime so i think it's because it's it's thought that and it might be true for for a percentage of people with bpd but it's thought that it really is the the best and only way to go in in a lot of areas and i don't know why because it's good and everything and effective but like i said it's it's not for everybody with bpd and i mean i understand the modality and i mean i if i had to go through that in my recovery decades ago i can tell you i wouldn't have liked it because i like the process group i like talking things out i like the interacting with others i like how many mistakes i made that i wasn't aware of that i would find out and learn about because other people called me on well you just did this or you were just like this or you you know so anyway i think it's um if you look at it from funding and cost analysis that's another reason so is that necessarily a bad thing no but it doesn't mean it doesn't leave enough resources where they they look at funding dbt because it's a get them in the door do the best you can get them out the door because of lack of funding i'm not saying that's how clinicians think but that's kind of how it works and, and and some burnt out clinicians are like that but but probably not the ones that specialize in dbt but the thing is it's not the only treatment but that's what you hear most about online too and i think like i said it doesn't have efficacy for everybody and um with funding cuts everywhere um institutions hospitals agencies are taking this on as a way to like i said move them in move them out move them in move them out because there are so many of them mc aj can you explain splitting when a bpd splits do they split in their own minds or do they split from the person that the go that they ghost or give the silent treatment to 
well, it's both. You know, it's internal splitting that is a repetition compulsion of the original internal split that was externalized for survival on a biological level in infancy and and at the point of uh, you know and and leading up to arrested emotional development so it the split is first within the person with bpd they have a fragmented ego they have a split off child ego state that that's gone until unless they get therapy so that's the other thing dbt can't really address the split off child fragmented you know dissociated thing in bpd i don't think but so the splitting the, the triggers and everything is they're triggered back to, and they don't know this, but it's all about the original splitting, the original split with the object of their mother, the first object in life. So it's always internal first, but it happens rapid fire. And the next thing you know, you're getting it because they don't, because, because they externalized it in infancy. And, and, and when they had to have like the split between good mother and bad mother, because they needed good mother to survive. But then there was the bad mother split. And then this really is what people with BPD relate to anybody. It's the good, the bad, you know, like the, the it, and, and their needs can't be satiated by anybody unless until they go through a lot of treatment, a lot of therapy. So the split happens first in them and, and but they get into distress, triggered to emotional dysregulation, repetition compulsion. It can't underlie enough how much dissociation is in that process. And then they're going to externalize it out at you because they're, they can be, they don't always have to be age regressed and they don't always, age, they don't always age regress to two years old or some crying baby infant, but they can regress to just a young child state, maybe even six, seven, eight years old. And it's overwhelming and they don't know what's happening to them. So the association made automatically is all that they're feeling has to be your fault because it was externalized for survival in the beginning. And it's just being repeated, repeated, repeated until unless they go to therapy. So I hope that answers your question. Hi there, Sarah. <clears throat> um, you said hi late. <clears throat> Excuse me late to be here tonight i think my ex wants to punish me partly to squash his pain inside well yes that's another thing they do because if they can be punishing you see the chaos and the drama of that that that's its engagement isn't it of the most high negative but uh variety but that is secondary gain payoff to them you know it's like well i'll get you and then they think that makes them feel better i don't know that it really does well, actually, when I experienced that, when I had BPD, I would say it was rather a joke. You don't, you might think that, you see, because it's all about the black and white of win-lose. And when they feel out of control, they feel like they're losing. And then when they abuse or punish or start to, you know, um, seek revenge on you, et cetera, make it hard for you out of their pain, then they start to feel more in control. So that feels satisfying. And then they feel like they won and you lost which is, you know, pretty much sandbox childlike stuff, right? Um, and you said he does um, all the abuse types to me, to the kids, my family. Yeah, I got out. Thank God. Kids working on it. Well, good. Yes, because that's the only, and, 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 and that's the only thing people can do. And often people wait too long. Like people get so beyond stressed, right? But traumatized by this. Car girl, um, wow, three to five year wait list. That sounds like disaster waiting to happen. Well, for many people it is because they will commit suicide long before they'll ever get their turn. Uh, and of course not everybody with BPD is, you know, in that space, but like when I had BPD, I was never suicidal. Like I said, I was atypical. So whether or not I really actually met the darn criteria, I kind of doubt it now, but like, I'm not interested in revisionist history because BP really, you know, it's it, BP really is a trauma response. It's not a personality disorder and it's not a mental illness. It's a trauma response. And that doesn't give anybody leeway or pass to treat others badly. But for people that keep wanting to keep stressing, it's a mental illness, it's a mental illness, must make them feel better about whatever's wrong with them then. You know, what, what, what are they so defensive about? And no, I don't forward this because I had BP and recovered 
and healed and blah, blah, blah. And so, like, I want to try to change. No, because what happened in my past, and I was atypical, so, you know, what happened in my past is what happened in my past. And it, I don't have skin in the game today, even though there are people out there that can't let go of the fact that they just think that that can't be true. Well, I'm not in their heads, and I don't know what their problem is, but, you know, I it never mind. I don't have to defend myself. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, I'm not saying it's three to five years everywhere, but it could be get, well, I don't know what it's like now, but, um, around areas where I live, it, it definitely has gone that high. Sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's two years, but that's still a long, long time. If people aren't getting any other support, right? Wheels, I'm really struggling with still wanting, um, love from your father. I'm pretty much accepted that never get that from psycho. But I still have a huge soft spot for him, even though I probably shouldn't. Well, Wheels, it's not that you shouldn't, because that, that's pretty normal. You know, like, that's you wanting the father that you never had. Or because he wasn't as abusive as your mother is. Um, but he also has not protected you. So you're in that place, really painful and difficult journey in in learning more and in your recovery where unfortunately unless he did something really redeeming in more than just the odd time he's gonna have to go in the file in the category under the bus with psycho these are the choices that he made that he's responsible for i mean i'm just saying that's how it usually works for people i'm not telling you what you have to do or how you have to feel about him but wanting love from him Obviously, by the sounds of it, you're not getting and you didn't get what you needed from him. And so that's, that matters, right? And and you have to decide to what degree. But I can say this much, though. As long as that parent that is the codependent with the narcissist in this case, uh, we think, if there's not something else wrong with them, um, when, they, when their allegiance is to the narcissist, then what you need to realize is going forward, like when you finally get out of there, you don't want him to know the address because he'll betray you every time for psycho. So that's just the dynamics, you know, that are involved. And, and, and it's, it's tragic because unless a parent has really stood out and been there for you and can stand up to the abuser, then they're, they're really not there for you. Sarah, I think I might be being stalked. Being careful now. I heard your message not to let it go. It's serious. Yes, definitely. And you need to take all the precautions in the world because there's reason to believe that that person in your life could be really dangerous. And when there's reason to believe that, to know that based on past behavior and or threats, then there's no way to predict. So people have to act as if it's more likely than not, because if, if you go the other way, it could be a disaster. Um, Dominic, uh, social media stalking. Yes, that's a growing problem. And you said 50 calls a day and emails keep me always on the edge while no contact. I can't start the grieving process when I feel she's right around every corner. Well, yeah, and but... With all due respect and no judgment, Dominic, you're not full no contact if you can get 50 calls a day and you can still get emails from this person. So think about that because you need to really, it's it's so much harder in this day and age, granted, you know, but you really need to eliminate all the avenues of any contact. And then if they show up at your door or your workplace, you call the police instantly because it's unwanted contact. And then the next step for anybody, male or female, is get a restraining order. Document, document, document. So don't throw out all the emails or if there's any messages left or you have a record of the calls, take pictures of all that, document all that, and then close off all the avenues of contact. Tuck that evidence away so you're not looking at it every day. But if you can't block the person in email, then you need to just change email. It can be really inconvenient, but you need to just close an account, block them, start a new one. And then on social media, 
I don't know. It, probably people have to go to great lengths, you know. But you have to just block them, block them, block them. And hopefully it's better on other things than on YouTube. But, um, and then you have to, like, anybody that, like, Facebook is a problem with that. A lot of people just go off Facebook when they're no contact. Because you might have somebody that you're not aware of that's leaking your information to them, even if they're blocked. And then they can make up 10,000 false accounts and find out what's going on with you anyway. So for some people, absolute no contact might mean withdrawing from social media, which is really inconvenient in the case of if you're keeping in touch with people from a distance, but then you can always set that up privately and you can like use Zoom or you can Skype. So I would just say it's really important, Dominic, to stop the ways that she can call you, you know, change the number, do whatever you have to do. And like I said, if you got to shut down the email account and create a new one, do that. And you might have to withdraw from social media if there's other places that aren't blocking. You know, you can't really block someone effectively enough. I don't know because I don't use many of them. Um, so, yeah, when you feel like she's right around every corner. But see, this is where a lot of people are talking about no contact. And more recently, and not only in live streams, but clients. And, and, and I think some of the comments reflect that on the channel, too that people are talking they're no contact, but they're not absolutely no contact. So other than the fact that those calls per day, if you have like call logs or get a hold of those and the documentation of the emails, etc., keep that as documentation and evidence, but cut off those avenues of contact because it is going to block your recovery. And that person is way out of control. So when they get into that kind of behavior, the the range of how dangerous can they be goes up because she's up in the ante as it is and and some of them know no limit to upping the ante at each step that you try to block and have boundaries um wheels i have a heck of a time trying to process all of his abuse recently um it's messing me up um in all kinds of ways it's depressing and confusing Especially because he's not awful all the time. Yeah, well, the intermittent not awful all the time. I hear you. It can be confusing. But I think that what's happening from him has gotten worse recently because Psycho's gotten worse. And what does that say? Well, he can't stand up to Psycho. He can't stand up for himself. And he turns it on you too. It's betrayal, I'm sorry to say. You said three to five year wait, that's messed up. Wouldn't a lot of them give up by then? Well, yes, in various ways of giving up. Literally on life or never mind therapy or treatment, you know. Um, Carolyn, I'm a psych nurse and have seen the devastating effects of severe child abuse. Well, yes, you would see it. And this arrested development, yes. And um I don't know if I just, if I said something earlier, but you know, I didn't mean to disrespect all psych nurses because of course there are many wonderful psych nurses out there. And I was helped by some many years ago in my life too. So, you know, um, and what you have to deal with in that profession. Yes. It's like you're right front lines to it all. And, um, it, you know, it, it's difficult and I'm sure you handle it well as a professional, but isn't it heartbreaking too on another level? that, you know, severe child abuse, uh, people, it, yeah, it creates severe problems. And, and we need to move to this, and the movement is um, happening, just not with American psychiatry, to the reality that these people were traumatized. And, and it doesn't give them a pass for their behavior now, but it's the lens through which we have to look at how to help people, I believe, anyway. Um, uh, Dominic said that's so true. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, you need, so you really need to take better care of yourself than you have been, Dominic, even though you've probably been doing a really good job. So, um, it's interesting because I didn't know when, when I did, you know, this, this topic for a live stream, I thought maybe there'd be, but you never know, right? I thought, I thought there'd be more people like kind of wanting to share about the, well, you did, Dominic, and, and in ways they've been abused, but um, or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and there's been some of that, but it's just interesting. It just depends who comes along and what people have to say. But, um, I think it's, it's not talked about enough online, um, because, well, I'm not sure why, 
you know, but a lot of, a lot of people or a few anyways, I've seen, um, and or heard about from clients talking about BPD, um, 10 or, or even if they're talking from being the perspective of an ex or, you know, um, writing on, on blogs or those sites, etc. There just seems to be this, not, not for everyone, but for some, just wanting to kind of like befriend borderlines. And I think really that's, that's something that I'm not trying to, you know, say all people with BPD. No, because, you know, there's a person or two here with BPD and often on streams are people here with BPD and I'm not trying to, you know, um, say stigmatizing things about people with BPD in general or anyone specifically. But now I lost my point. Um, yeah, there just seems to be a, a lot online. So, so people that are trying to align with, trying to sound all sensitive and nice, and I'm not trying to be the opposite of that, but don't really deal or know enough about BPD to deal with this side of it, the darker side, the reality of it for many with BPD and many who are going to, you know, be close to them and experience this. Uh, I guess that's otherwise agended probably, but anyway, Wales, I'm not taking this as you telling me how to feel AJ. This stuff is hard to hear, but it's necessary. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to help wheels and I, and I'm not, you know, anything I say obviously is just to help you with what you are thinking about and processing and, and not to tell you what to do at all. But I think an important point that I did make is how could you ever trust your father when they he's proven he's allied with the main abuser. And so if you get out of there, for example, I, I think what you're looking at wheels for your own safety and going forward in your life is you're going to have to go no contact. Uh, well, I shouldn't say you're going to have to, but I don't know that you're really going to have a choice. I mean, you have a choice, but I think you have to really work toward, you know, a choice I had to make years ago. And because it, when, when it's that much in the family, like in your siblings as well, there can't be any trust extended to them when you finally get out of there because they will, they're enablers, if not flying monkeys to the psycho. Anthony, it's finally, uh, sorry, it's when family and friends um, that you thought care do it to you. They did it to me, and I have been no contact for close to 10 years, living good now, but they are lurking and want back in. A never-ending battle. Yeah, I'm so ser sorry to hear that, Anthony, because I've been through that myself, and, and when I say been in the past tense, I've had a couple of situations where they tried to get rather intrusive into my life, and um, that was pretty, like, <laughs> it was pretty scary. But um, I'm lucky that the variety of family of origin I have, that they are um, weird in the fact that a kind of like out of sight, out of mind kind of deal. So I don't know. I think the odd thing reverberates for some of them because I'm online, but I don't know if they care anymore because frankly, I don't care what they care about. So, and I've had to make a few things. I've had to lay down a couple things, which meant yes, contact with one of them to say that if someone else in the family of origin, um, you know, well, they've, they've been doing some things and they've been, you know, and I said, if this doesn't stop, and when I know it's them, you know, I said, I'm going to have no choice but to start, you know, I've documented. I said, next thing is I'm going to call the police. I said, you better make sure this person, you know, like that family abortion person, I'm not even going to say my whatever. Um, I, I just said, my message was neutralize them, do something about it, or there'll be consequences. But I, even when I was growing up as a kid, yeah, it was pretty bad and everything, but my parents were, there's different kinds of narcissists, right? Or dark triads and the comorbid BPD, NPD. Some will re unrelentingly seek after you for supply and to want to get you back under their control. And I guess I went through that for a time, but a long time ago now. And then they just, bit, even when I was living at home, they often, when I was out of sight, I was out of mind until they got triggered and dysregulated by something. They'd come find me and scream and yell at me. So I've always felt kind of, it's a weird thing to say, but kind of lucky in that regard. But, you know, it's, it's, um, 
I guess the important thing, Anthony, hopefully you're there, is to just, um, you know, not let any of that affect you emotionally anymore, which is hard, right? But that's what you have to keep working on. In fact, if that's, you know, because you said never ending battle. Well, a battle of boundaries is one thing, but hopefully you've learned to observe and not absorb. Um, Ziggy, I was never actually in a relationship with BPD woman, but she convinced me she was in love with me to the point that I moved cities. And then when I got there, uh, you oh, when you got here, she was like, oh, I just don't want to be friends. I'm so sorry to hear that because, you know, that, that there's a lot of reasons why that could have happened, but nothing that justifies it. And also, that's it shows how they don't attach and they don't love and they're not really committed. And I mean, people that have significant treatment or something could be different. I'm not saying everybody, uh, but that's terrible. I'm really sorry you went through that. Um, yeah, I think I picked that up, Anthony, that correction there. Um, I hope I did. Um, and so she said, I had assumed it all. Oh God. Sorry to hear that. Now I am gone. Now I have gone no contact because I realized my codependence. Well, good for you. And I'm sure that that's, you know, still a difficult and painful place to be, but yeah, look after yourself. And, um, and that's another thing about, you know, people meet on the internet, dating sites, long distance stuff. You really have to try lots of visits. And I'm not, I'm not blaming you or anything. It's not your fault, right? But to avoid what happened to Ziggy, people need to try lots of visits. And spending time and really finding out who that person is. Because as much as you might really think you know them from a distance, it's nothing like up close and personal. And, of course, you know, when she said you assumed it all, if she has BPD, um, that's just in a category of denial and pretty cruel. And if there's NPD traits, then it's gaslighting. But people with BPD have ways, I think, that they do gaslight. But I don't think it's the same as narcissists, but still. Um, but but I'm glad that you um, have gone no contact and you need to take care of yourself. Yes. And, and really, you know, take the time to get working with somebody and heal the codependence. Find out more about your family of origin, your childhood, your, you know, your wounded inner child. Really take 18 months to two years to do that for yourself. And before you want to, you know, date anymore, because otherwise you will continue to attract these people, unfortunately. And even if you do spot some red flags, maybe some people don't spot all of them. And then you said, um, but I struggle to understand how someone could do all these things to what feels like manipulation to be in love with her. Um, could do all these things to what feels like, oh, like she, like you felt manipulated into loving her or just manipulated because you were feeling love for her. I'm not sure what you mean, but well, yeah, it's, it's really not the way that most people would behave, is it? But, you know, and maybe you didn't realize she had BPD or whatever she does have. And, like, um, so it, it's unconscionable, you know. Somebody moves to a place to be with you, how, how far or from the other side of the world or wherever they come from. And then the person says, oh, you just, like, assumed all that. I mean, that's their lack of responsibility taking again. And it's just horrific. And, and yeah, nobody can be prepared that somebody could ever... I'm going to say not only treat you that way, but abuse you that way, because that's what that was. And there's no way you could have seen that coming. So I hope you don't blame yourself for that. Anthony, they are lacking humanity. Like AJ says, they lack civility. Well, yeah, lack of identity. Um, I, I don't know if they're lacking humanity, but yeah, they... The trauma really gets in the way of their humanity. I guess it would be, you know reasonable to say for sure and um and and they lack civility and so do the narcissists and i don't know a lot of people in the world i think civility is missing out there um anthony um large italian families are hard to go no contact with oh i can appreciate that um but i did it and you can too oh good and, and maybe you're talking to ziggy but that's i hear you because you know i mean i i'm not of Italian descent or anything, but I, I have friends who are, and they have 
big, in their case, they're lucky, big loving families. And yes, it's, it's just culturally different than my heritage, which, you know, I put my middle finger up when I changed my name legally anyway, uh, that waspy, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, stiff upper lip from British, etc. ancestry, blech. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have a few really good friends who are French Canadian or definitely Italian or mixed. And, and ethnic, you know, more, well, I shouldn't say more ethnic cultures, but these cultures, um, with, you know, different ethnicities, they blow my mind still to this day, how warm they are, how demonstrative, I mean, it could be the opposite, right? If they were abusers, but how warm they are, how demonstrative, how affectionate it's lovely because, you know, that's not the way, well, my family of origin, never mind, but my ancestry even. Or, or people with my common ancestry of, you know, Brit mine's British, Scottish, and Australian, but, like, um, it's that British thing, you know. So I'm not saying all people from Britain are the same either, but um, he's, Anthony said, yeah, it's like a cult. Well, depending on, you know, with people BP, one thing, but when narcissists are involved too, it can become very much its own little cult, you know. Um and um, Anthony said, I knew at age tw uh, 12 or so, something was off. Went no contact in my mid-30s. Well, I can relate in a way, Anthony, because I think I was about eight, you know, between six and eight. Not that I had any intellectual awareness of what it was, but I had that real sense of something's really off and crazy here too. But I mean, I couldn't process it or understand it in any intellectual way. But good for you, because I think we have that intuition, you know, and when we're kids, we can't always make sense out of it, but it will make sense going forward. Yeah, and I went no contact right at about the age of 29, just about to turn 30. Um, and that was before the internet, before books. I just say that because I don't know how the hell I figured that out. It was just like, I need to get away from these people. So it wasn't even called no contact back then. You're very welcome, Ziggy. And uh, then you said, you're absolutely correct. Laugh out loud. Um, MC, well, thank you for the thumbs up. Hey there, Tommy. Um, the hardest part is realizing the person you spent every day with for so long suddenly changed their values, wants, beliefs, etc. It's like the person you were with disappeared. She seemed so sincere. Well, yeah, but the thing you have to realize is that what was all this sudden change for you wasn't as sudden for them, you know, so not that they're being so, um, purposefully trying to dupe you or anything, but they don't have any sense of security. And of course, when, when, when you fall in love with them and they're mirroring that back to you and they think they love you, they're really seeking identity through you. And so it would be really suddenly like she suddenly changed uh, values, wants, beliefs, etc. Well, it, she never really had those values, wants, and beliefs, but, you know, so it would be shocking and sudden for you. And I'm sure she's been through many iterations of all these kind of changes because people at BPD do this a lot. They're so chameleon-like in that regard. And again, it's not with a malice kind of, you know, like not trying to dupe people like narcissists will, but it is still devastatingly painful. And, um, yeah, I can believe that she seemed so sincere. And you said, and I adored her. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I feel for you, man. I really do. Um, well, thank you for that, MC. Anthony, um, said sorry to Tommy. Yeah. Hey there, Rob. How you doing? How you, I know we're on a different subject, but how you holding up after that abysmal Toronto Maple Leaf performance last night? I'll just say that now because maybe you'll get back to me in a bit. Um, you said, can you give an example of the difference in how a BPD gaslights versus NPD? Well, yeah, this is something that, you know, I, I, well, not everybody with BPD is the same, but I think, and again, it isn't necessarily that comorbidity between BPD and NPD is really increasing as vastly as I once thought as I look into it more and more. But I have a video on that out there. I think it's called How Borderlines Gaslight, but it's more specific to certain situations. 
So um, a difference in the way a person with BPD would gaslight versus a narcissist. Okay. The narcissist is going to know that they're full of shit. That's one thing. So again, it goes back to intent more than something more often goes back to intent more than something that the person on the receiving end can actually ferret out, if that makes any sense. But so narcissist gaslight with intent, I mean, I don't know about all of them, but, but a lot, most and malignant narcissists, they're targeting. They are not feeling a whole lot about it. It's like they're predatory in, in that sense of it's a chase, right? And, and that gives them supply. But people with BPD, their gaslighting is more like part of their dissociation. And I'm not saying they don't remember things. It's they're backpedaling away from accountability and responsibility. And then it's largely the projective identification of, but like you did it, I didn't do it, which essentially is like gaslighting. And then also it's like that you made me do it. And that blame shifting of, shame you know because the narcissist might have been shamed but has a shame wound but is not in touch with the shame wound so the person with bpd again the intent being so different the presentation maybe not sometimes but the person with bpd is going to say well you made me do it or you said this so that that's why i said this or you you didn't do this for me so that's why like i broke your pictures over there um, but, but it's, it, that's not a really good example though, because the way it happens in trying to communicate people with BPD do that, you know, um, they throw in a red herring, they change the subject, they, they turn everything around on you and they blame shift and, and then you end up in, you know, the justify, argue, defend and explain Jade response. And then when you tried to talk to them, so the red herring changed the topic in that kind of example is how really people with BPD are gaslighting and avoiding personal responsibility. So I think, and I still want to look into this more before I just say this as like, this is the absolute truth of it all. But for some people with BPD out there, I think it's fair to say that intent aside being different from the narcissist, we're getting to a place now in the world, and, and certainly the questions I get here, working with clients, the things people share on the channel, things you see online about the experience of people, I think the line of what's different between how somebody with BP gaslights and a narcissist gaslights, other than the intent is not going to be the same, I think in the experience of it, it's starting to get to the point where there isn't a discernible difference when you're the person in the experience who's hurting because like it's my job to work with people and to understand and to be able to analyze and parse things whether i say anything about them or not but when you're in a relationship with somebody or you have been i have to say now finally that you know experientially there probably isn't much difference so still holding to the factual reality that when people with BPD, when people experience people with BPD gaslighting them, people with BPD that is happening for a different reason and without the same intent as a narcissist. So see how I'm parsing that to really say the intent is different, but I don't think that matters when you're experiencing it. So, and then there's other areas of communication and what happens in relationships where I think there's a vast difference and what I spoke to said a few minutes ago and what my video on it speaks to um, can really show that as being different and recognizable with somebody with BPD. But in terms of when you're really being abused, traumatized, hurt, I, I think experientially it would just feel and seem the same. Uh, Ziggy, thank you, AJ. I'm doing all that now and I'm on a self-imposed relationship ban. Well, good for you, because I had a, I didn't have the word partner. Yeah, I had a, a relationship. <laughs> I don't have any emotions left over, but trip over these words. From 2004 to 2006, and it's a complicated story and it doesn't matter. But I had this, quote, partner who had BP, NPD, and was an alcoholic. And what a freaking nightmare. 
And but my main point about that is after I got out of that, broke up with her, realized what was going on, um, which I was a little slow on the uptake. There's a reason for that, but it doesn't matter here. Um, then what happened was I I knew right then and there after that, I said, well, I'm not going to date anybody for at least 18 months. But that would be because I work with people and I, I you know, but I, so I set that limit on myself, too. And then when I got to the 18 month um, time frame and was actively working on, you know, healing all the pain that, that I definitely was caused in that relationship, um, then I gave myself another six months. I just decided, like, I was doing pretty good after 18 months, but I was just like, yeah, I think I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. So, and, and that's, you know, you can play it by ear that way because I think, um, a self-imposed relationship ban, it, I always advise for about 18 months minimum, and then people can see where they're at there, and then some people may need more time, and some people might not. Anthony, that's why um, most of us are here, to learn and heal. We are winning the battle, um, oh, because AJ is a great teacher. Well, thank you, Anthony. I'm, again, just humbled and inspired. I do my best. Um, very kind of you. Wheels, I got you. I've been thinking back on a few things lately. The last few situations with him have shown me a lot. I think sometimes it feels the crazy is too crazy for me to wrap my head around. Well, and I don't know if that's a reference to overall or the psycho part of the equation of the crazy, but you've been betrayed by your whole entire family of origin, right? So that's the other thing you have to keep working on as well processing and feeling and um and probably grieving ziggy yes manipulation into being in love well yes and the thing about that and and um and then you said i feel so seen aj thank you so much you're very welcome um that that's something that is a sacred honor you know not only on live streams but when i work with clients such a sacred honor just to be there to witness and see people who, like what you just acknowledged, that you haven't felt seen at all by someone or even maybe going back to family of origin in some people's cases. I know how huge that was in my healing journey as well. Um, and when you said manipulation into being in love, I'm not sure if you meant that she was just, it was all manipulation on her part because there was nothing real there. But in a way, it's like there's there's two aspects there, right? There can be a lot of manipulation from them and then there's that unfortunate reality of you couldn't know what was happening and something in your life, you have codependency, has affected you in a way that you still need to work on and understand and learn more about and heal. So it's like, but yeah, there's, they are, they are often manipulative and maybe it's not intentional. And then people make decisions, but people make decisions based on their manipulation, right? And, and when you don't know, and you've never had this happen to you before, then you don't see the red flags because there's always red flags, but like, Hey, you know, I saw red flags of the BP NP alcoholic that I got involved with. Um, <clears throat> and I went forward anyway. So yeah, when we get a bit of that too good feeling, um, you know, the, the whole thing too, people need to remember when you're falling in love with somebody and that's how you're experiencing it, even if they're manipulating you and you can't imagine what's going to come next because, you know, people can't know that until they've experienced it. Falling in love, even if people have healthier boundaries or more identified boundaries, when you're falling in love, boundaries come down. So there's an extra vulnerability there. And that's another aspect of that idealization mirroring and people at BP in the beginning, the codependency of people pleasing and their desperation to merge and connect and be with you because they are looking for identity. They don't know that, but yeah. So it's, it's, uh, some people can't avoid the pitfalls sometimes is probably the best way to put that. And then in healing and recovery, we kind of have to bite that bullet called, um, <clears throat> but yes, I made some choices too albeit what else could you have done at the time right and um 
and I'll just say I got blindsided by the BPNP alcoholic because I first saw her as a social worker and then she did the most horrible thing a mental health professional could ever do. And it was, it was tantamount to what's known as sexual abuse, though I'm not saying that was physically the case, but, and I was more aware I was not stupid, but for some reason I thought, well, but it's different in this case and I can handle this. I was so wrong because it was traumatizing. And of course, I didn't know that she was that crazy. Um, Michael, hey there. Why can't a BPD control their off, um, off the cuff emotion, but later realize they were a little out of line? Well, that's that's a good question. It has to do with when the trigger happens, which again, other people aren't the cause of the triggers. Like, like I mean. In childhood, yes, parent, whatever happened, but not significant other or person in their life now. When they get triggered, they go off the cuff because there is no control there. It, they're re-experiencing something from the past, and to whatever degree that is in that dysregulation, they are gone. They are actively in a repetition compulsion, and however they behaved in the past, they're going to behave the same way now, over and over and over, if they don't get treatment. So they can later realize, but like you said, a little out of line. Well, maybe they were a lot out of line, but they can realize later. And I remember, you you know, way back decades ago, and when I had BPD, well, I would do some mean and shitty things to people. And maybe within three minutes or so right after, I would be, oh my God. And I would feel remorse. But when I was transported to the dissociation of the trigger that I had no flipping idea about, I couldn't do better. And I'm not saying it wasn't my responsibility. It was, but I could not do better then. And people can't until unless they get treatment. Um, uh, Carolyn, a question. What are the under, maybe you mean pinnings of bipolar one? Yes. Um, you see similarities. Well, this is something admittedly I still have to look into more because I, I, I don't know what's going on with psychiatry, and I'd be interested if you want to share here what the similarities are that you see, because I haven't really looked into that, you know, like the underpinnings of bipolar, anything that I've ever read, which is not extensive, I have to admit, because bipolar is not where I specialize at all. I guess I should incorporate it more, though, and learn more, but I think um, as far as I understand it, there might be some similarities. But yet, especially with bipolar one, there's vast differences too. You know, like for, for one thing's for sure. Like I think at one point in my life way ages ago, I, because I had a partner who was bipolar and I started to wonder if maybe I had that too, but the difference being she had bipolar one and I'm not sure what the other qualifiers were. I'm like, she would, she would not sleep period. Right. Like she would go into mania and like, and, and and this is one of the things I think is different, but I don't know. But for me, when I had BPD, there was never a time I didn't sleep. I might not, you know, I might not have been able to sleep at a given moment, but I would always have to sleep. And if I was up because I was up upset, you know, like overnight, then I would be sleeping the next day. Like there was no way that I could just go on. No mania there. So, but what, but I'd love it, Carolyn, if you'd show what you see the similarities are. Because I'm wondering why all of a sudden, because I, I don't think they're the same. But yeah, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, DB, we do everything we can to understand our daughter and make her happy. Well, that's just, you know, I hear you, but guess what? You can't make, in quotes, her happy. Because we can't make anybody feel anything. But I hear you. It doesn't matter what we say, do, or give. The next second, she seems to actually forget, and we're to blame for everything and anything. Well, and again, is it forgetting, the splitting, how much dissociation? Because I have to say, and again, I was atypical, and I only say that not because I'm trying to say, oh, I was a special kind of borderline, but I probably didn't meet all the criteria, to be bloody honest about it, as I've learned now in retrospect, but I'm not going to do revisionist history. Because the thing about that is, um, 
I don't think, I think I jumbled some things up with dissociation, but I don't think I ever forgot anything. I think I got some things confused and I think I had less clarity about what I bloody was doing on purpose, but less clarity with dissociation. But I'm still not defending any of that. But that's what happens for people with BP. And until, unless, and I got lots of treatment, I was going to treatment. But until, unless they work through that in treatment, it's the self, it's the awareness deficit in the trauma response known as BPD. The awareness deficit is huge along with that internal and original and ever, you know, reactionary continually, that splitting that is externalized happens internally first and is externalized in a nanosecond. So um, just know that you can't make her happy as much as you want to, you know, because she's just, she can't hold happy. She wouldn't know happy if it bit her in the nose, I hate to tell you. Why that is in your daughter's specific case, I'm not going to try to guess. Um, or I mean not even guess. I'm not going to put any meaning to it because just out of respect for you. Um, Carolyn, I see similar similarities with BPD and bipolar. Um, well, please do say more and I'll get down there. I hope you will say more. Um, because I'm sure shrinks are seeing similarities too, but I, I, I don't know what that is about now, you know? Um, DB, um, it feels very abusive. Well, she is being abusive. It is abuse and that is borderline abuse. But, and when I say borderline abuse, I mean people with BPD abusing someone, not, oh, it's a little bit abusive. No, it's abuse. And um, it's her trauma response, which doesn't make it okay. Sarah, I was always to blame at the end of the day, too. His problems always came back to be my fault. It's so freaking crazy. Well, and again, you know, it's the way that they are projecting out, and not even projection, they just are associating that immediate need to externalize their distress, emotional dysregulation, fear, anxiety, terror, all of the above, whatever it could be, uh, onto the nearest closest person because that's what they did originally with the trauma and the distress, which was in infancy is on a biological level only. And can I just insert here at a crazy place? I need to say it again because of misinformation by others out there. When people with BPD seek the treatment, go through the treatment, go through the process, preferably psychodynamic therapy at some point, do that deep work that I did. Healing and recovery brings us back because neuroplasticity is an element of it too. The brain changes. I just want to categorically say this is not in defense of myself. This is for others. That people and people putting misinformation out there, oh, they're always going to be trying to deal with it. No, it's not true. Maybe people just don't like the idea that somebody can go through that kind of trauma and actually do the work and heal. And I'm not the only person. Do the work and heal it. And I am as mentally healthy as the next mentally healthy person. I always call it averagely mentally healthy because nobody's freaking perfect. So I really want to underscore this because of other people saying the opposite out there. When people really dedicate themselves to this journey, it took me 16 years, it is no joke. It is hard work, it is daunting, and it hurts like hell, but you can get through it. And when we do get through it, those of us that have gotten through it, healed and recovered, past tense, even though psychiatry still says that's impossible, but who cares about psychiatry? They're just trying to sell stuff and make money. They're never going to be about the fix. They're all about pathologizing the problem and not even correctly. So passionately, I say to people out there with BPD, if you don't think you can get better, you can get better and you can get all the way better and you can know yourself and you can live a life that you never imagined before. And I don't want to hold myself up as any model or anything, but like I am living proof of that as well as neuroplasticity. And these are just facts. And let all the trolls and detractors shit their pants all they want. I don't care. You know, these are the facts. And not just because it's me, my life, not just talking about me. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I know what my life is like. It's fabulous. Thank you very much. Great relationship, etc. So, but my life was fabulous whether I was in a relationship or not. But the bottom line is, you know, um, people can come all the way back. It just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of daunting work. 
And I don't have all the answers as to why so many people with BPD don't even start the journey. Many do, and many are on all kinds of different iterations of that journey. And I believe other people have healed and recovered too. I just don't know anybody personally. Well, I mean, I have some clients that have healed and recovered, um, but they're off living their lives now. <laughs> I'm working with other clients. Um, Rav, ha ha, game was so boring. Oh, I know. I wasn't even going to watch it because I was actually finishing the last video I put up last night and dealing with that. And the game had started, <coughs> but I'd gone and, and DVR'd it. And so I got in there about maybe 8.20, 8.25 or something. And the first thing that hits me that I don't enjoy is, yeah, I thought it would be weird to watch because I like what they've done with the stands, you know, covering them and everything because it's freaking weird. But, you know, all I have to say about, I don't know if I'm going to invest much more of my time watching these games anymore, but I should read the rest of your comment. He said, John Tortorella has that team coach so well. Well, that's very true. And clog up the neutral zone and frustrate the other team's offense. Yes. Austin Matthews was the only player I noticed. Well, and, and I admit that, um, <coughs> like you said, the game was so boring. So I had the game on, but then, you know, so I was watching it in my, I have a TV in the living room, but I was watching it in my bedroom. And then my bedroom, bedroom air conditioner, it was like getting really hot in there. And I'm like, I don't think I hear that thing. What's going on? Sure enough, went kaput last night. But even so, the game was so boring that I was like reading a book. I was playing with my dogs. I wasn't really watching it. I was just listening to it. And then as soon as, you know, going into the third period, 0-0, zero, zero, and Toronto not doing enough and or the coaching, but they've got to build the system. I mean, they're a team that is ostensibly weaker at the back end and built for offense. And if they're going to score zero, well, good night, you know, uh, <laughs> a lousy saying, right? It's over. The The fat lady's already kind of sung as far as I'm concerned. Um, so if, if, if clogging up the neutral zone and, and shadowing them, et cetera, is going to make them not be able to, you know, mix it up, get creative, or be better coach, then, it, you know, they're toast already. And, you know, I do you watch, by the way, Rob, do you watch Steve Dangle, you know, LFR, the fan reaction? Hopefully you know about him, because if you don't know about him, look him up, because his, his reaction, his video last night was priceless. Prices. I love that guy. He's got such a big heart, too. He just had a son recently. Yay, happy. And then five days after that, one of his dogs passed away. And he's raised so much money. I was just honored to be on one of his live streams that was, you know, for charity for um, Ontario Easter Seals, you might be familiar with. And for handicapped children, because he has a handicapped sister. The guy's got such a heart, but I love. He works for Sportsnet, too. But I love his fan reaction videos and everything he does. And so I was on his live stream. I was really happy to donate when um, he did that months ago because the guy's got a big heart. He's, he wrote a book too, you know. He, what is his book? I have it, and I've read most of it. I haven't finished it. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 like I forget the whole title, but about the Maple Leafs. This team is ruining my life. And his intro in his videos, he's changed it up again. It's great. Like he's always screaming and yelling, and he's very entertaining. He's like. Why do I even watch this team? This team is running my life. Which I could definitely say after, you know, I'm 62 now. They last won the cup when I was nine. You can figure it out. But, like, I think they're toast already. They're a team that's built to score. And they took, you know, with, with the cap stuff, they've taken away a lot that they need on the back end. I, I don't see it going any better than it went last night, frankly. And um, that is utter futility. So I'm already thinking about who am I going to be rooting for when they're out. And if they're out again, I said this to myself last night. Well, actually, I was my partner and I were watching together, so I said it to her too. I said, you know what? And she couldn't believe it. But I said, I seriously mean this. If they blow this and they're gone in the first round again, I think I'm done. I might still wear the odd leaf hat. I might care a little bit, but I, I just can't be on this, this futility train anymore. And the other thought I had when well, my partner brought it up last night was interesting. She said, well, you know, the Leafs always kind of can sometimes get to the game seven and be the underdog and be down. The 
And you think maybe it might help them in a five-game series. And I, I thought about it. And I said, you know what? I think they'll screw it up game if they come back at all. They'll screw up game five as much as they'd screw it up if it was game seven. So, But um, I'd be interested to hear, Rob, if, if you know about Steve Dangle, which isn't his real name because his real name's on the book. I can't remember it. But, man, his and, – and before they went back to playing during the break, he did videos recapping the whole season, like game 1 to 10, 20 to 30, whatever, all the way up to 70 games. Guy's amazing. Um, Car Girl, AJ, um, I know you're going to laugh. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, but I must say good night to you. Oh, no, I'm not going to laugh. And all. I need about six hours sleep to function. Um, well, yeah, it's, uh, well, okay, so you, that's, er but you probably have to get up earlier than I do, yeah. And hope everyone has a good night. Oh, well, you too, um, car girl. And, um, I'm going to be getting back to an email soon too, because believe me, I haven't forgotten you. I've just been crazy busy. And, um, <laughs> right now it's clients and time zones that keep, we, we keep, I've made a few mistakes to be honest, and they're making a lot of mistakes too. And we never meet up at the right time. So, and then people are feeding me the time backwards and, you know, so anyway, um, yeah, you take care of yourself and, um, just, you know, keep on gaining that awareness like you are. Um, DB, thank you for the kind words tonight. No, to Cargo, yes. Um, Carolyn, AJ, does BPD still show itself in the same ways during senior years? Well, yeah, I mean... Pseudoscience of American psychiatry has something to say about that too. The other side of their mouth doesn't make sense, don't they? I would say it, it can change somewhat, but it's not this like idea that psychiatry says, because see, they're trying to treat it like a brain disorder, like a medical condition. So they use the word remit. Oh, well, people when you know, so here's what they say, as you're probably aware. They say people need therapy, you got BPD. You know, it's all this stuff in your brain, or we're seeing this stuff, blah, 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 blah. And there's no cure, because, uh, frankly, nobody needs a cure, because it's not what psychiatry says it is in the first place. So anyway, then they'll say, yeah, you got this for life, and you got, and then they give them meds, blah, 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 blah. and then they say, people can, it's what people go down, and actually a professional can, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, assess somebody has having healed enough that to where you can see trait reduction through healing to say, if somebody wants to be this ridiculous about it, this person now has four traits. Well, you know what? If somebody presents to a psychiatrist for, with four traits, that might mean a lot, right? Behaviorally and emotionally, they don't get diagnosed. Oh, but if you tip over one, you do. And so then when people maybe have five, six, seven of them or all of them, this trait thing is so nuts. But then when they think they're under five, they say, well, I, I've remitted. I, and, and it's largely not true, especially if they declare it themselves. So having said all that, this idea of remittance, if you're below the traits of the diagnosis, doesn't work that way in reverse. And the other thing is, so psychiatry says all this pathologizing stuff about BPD and it's horrible and it's this and it's that, and they can't be cured, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, but, you know, when people get older, it kind of remits and just gets better. No, it doesn't, because both sides of their narrative are equally nuts, in my opinion. And they can't scientifically prove anything. So I think what happens, and I think what they based this on, was a very misogynistic principle that maybe women with BPD having to endure the menstrual cycles especially I was annoyed with that in a way because I was never going to have a kid and I went through all that for nothing in a way, but hey, part of being a woman. So as, as women know, and of course it does cause more emotional dysregulation and problems for people with BPD because it does that for women without BPD, right? Because we get more in touch with our feelings or, and in some people's uh, way of looking at it, this is a sacred time for women in the month and and I don't know what the heck all that's about. But so I think when they said it kind of remits after like eh, in the 50s, because I think they were thinking specifically about a lot of problems that a lot of women with BP have with their cycles and with different 
you know, conditions that go along with that. I had horrific premenstrual syndrome and cramps, but I didn't really have the PMDD or the whatever it's called. And I didn't have any other functional problems inside. So that's what I think that's based on. And what I think can happen for people, maybe at 50 or 60, but it doesn't happen for lots of people. Let me just underscore that. Is if they're raging, acting out borderlines, they might just have a little less energy. Maybe they're not as hormonally driven if they're female. That might play a role. But it doesn't mean anything else is ostensibly changed about their emotional landscape, except they might be a little less ragey when they rage. Or they might not rage as much, but they still are going to have all the issues that they've had. This idea that it just drops out of sight, no, I don't think so. And I've had clients that are the adult child of borderline, and then they're caretaking the parent. I'll never forget this one client. She was, because it was about maybe 10 years ago, so she was older than me, but she was like about my age or a little bit older, like and I'm 62 now. She was in her 60s then, and her mother was 80-something, and her mother was really abusive and never there for her, et cetera, et cetera. And she had... BPD herself, but she, you know, we worked on some of that. But one of the biggest the things that she talked about a lot in sessions was that she, you know, she didn't know what to do about her mother because she didn't really want to be in the caretaking role, but she felt guilty and all kinds of things like that. And we were working through that. But what I'm trying to say is so she was reporting to me like her mother that she was trying to help was beating her when she could, you know, with a cane and still abusive, and so this was a woman with BP in her 80s, and that's just one example. I've heard many others. So I would say, you know, it's, it, yeah, there, I guess what I've said is about all I can say to that, but, you know, narcissists get worse with age is the general um, consensus. People with BP don't have to get worse, but they're certainly not going to get magically better. Uh, so I I don't know. Psychiatry like I said in another video, I can't remember the context, but they don't just talk out of two sides of their mouth. They talk out like uh, about eight pieces or parts of their mouths and, and they contradict themselves a lot. So, and I have nothing against all psychiatrists. I'm just talking about the power working group, the ones that write the DSM. And then of course they're inculcated to the hegemony of big pharma now because it's the way they're trained. It's what they're taught. That's why I wonder why anybody wants to be a psychiatrist, be a psychologist, be a social worker. Just why would you want to be a psychiatrist? Or like, you know, be a psych nurse. That's cool. Um, you know, I was trying to wrap my head around psychos crazy is enough on its own. Well, and by the way, you shouldn't be trying to wrap your head around her crazy. You should just be trying to figure out how to protect yourself from it. Because trying to really figure it out, that will just be crazy making and more stressful. He said, I can't even begin to wrap my mind around the rest of them right now. The whole situation is whacked. And for lack of better words, I don't have words for it right now. Well, I totally understand that. And I just want to say again, Wheels, you know, our situations were not the same. And I am 40 years older than you. But way back when, just know you're not alone and you're not the only one going through it now. And I went through a lot of similar of what you're saying. And it's really when the family of origin is so in the control of the narcissist They've all betrayed you, and when you can get the hell out of there, you can't you can't look back. I mean, you need to work that through for yourself. You need to process that, but there isn't a one among them that you can trust. So so keep on working on your self trust, Carolyn. I agree with you, AJ. For me, the lines blur in some of the behaviors. I guess I'm saying the adolescent behaviors. Um. Oh, and as are you talking about the bipolar BPD similarities or something else because sometimes it's hard to remember the context um and you said I guess I'm saying oh uh, yes and then you said thank you for sharing your wisdom and experiences oh you're very welcome and, and then Carolyn you said I did um the very painful work too AJ raised by two narcissistic people but it's possible to reprogram ourselves well yeah and I think really reprogram is one way to put it but, you know, we unlearn all the defenses, which is very vulnerable in the process. But then, so then we 
you know, we, we have to get stripped down to the bare bones emotionally, and that's difficult. And then we have to find the self, get in touch with that lost, you know, inner child. And then we have to take on that upload of pain, and we're already in enough pain. And then with the help of therapists, like it was therapists in my case, and group therapy or therapist, then, then, you know, the reparenting happens and the, the, the external self is formed by the therapist and then it gets internalized in the process and then it's nurturing and healing and the inner child and coming together and being whole instead of fragmented. And yeah, and, and so, you know, I, I don't call it reprogramming, but we have to unlearn everything that we learned that we needed to, you know, that, that were implicit and biologically driven in the beginning defenses. And then defenses we had to continually mount to survive, have to unlearn all that and then learn what it was we couldn't learn during early childhood development. But once we do that, like we emerge as solidly healthy people if we go through the whole process. And I'm just underscoring that because I'm sick and tired of hearing other YouTubers talk shit about it when they don't even freaking and they really don't know what they're talking about. And I'm I'm not just saying that lightly, as opposed to other people who just say stuff for whatever reason, they say it, and maybe they just don't get it or something. And Carolyn, one thing I had to do was shut the door on all peop all but two people in the quote family unquote. Well, I hear you, Carol, and and um and you're fortunate there were two people you didn't have to shut the door on because you know I mean I I didn't. There was one maybe I didn't have to, but that aunt of mine who was a really kind person, she, I don't know, they were all codependent, right? So they would feel guilty if, like, I didn't bother pursuing a relationship with a couple of them because they were their allegiance was too close to my mother. And I didn't want to get in that all, you know, drama. But, um, uh, Rav, Steve Dangle has an amazing personality. Love his videos. Yeah, so you know about him too. Cool. Um, Kirsty, um, thank you from Europe. Oh, you're very welcome. Wheels, are there many treatments for NPD? I know there's nothing for malignant narcissists, but what about mild to mid-range ones? Well, you know, Wheels, I, before I answer your question, I don't think you're dealing with a mid-range or mild one. You know that, right? Um, but, um, yeah, there there are a couple of people who are pioneering in the field. Um, uh, Wendy Beharry comes to mind, and then a couple of books written. Um, of course, there's what Backman's up to, but I don't know what the hell that's about. I'm not even going to give a comment, because um, that's rather it sounds rather like more than it. it, it never mind. Um, but I think that I mean I've worked with people with NPD. I've worked with people with BP comorbid NPD. I still am, but I think really what so. So there's still more. Now they're trying, you know, transference focused psychotherapy can work for some people with NPD. But again, we're talking people that just tip into the diagnosis, which is still pretty formidable. Or that have four traits. Or yeah, I mean trait count is ridiculous in my mind. But it's whether or not they can, you know, be aware that there's something wrong. Uh, you know, because a lot of people with narcissistic personality, no. Even some people with BPD just think it's everybody else's fault. But so um, applying transference focused psychotherapy to that seems like it has some efficacy, and I would say in my experience and also what I'm reading, and also uh, schema therapy. So, um, but again, it's it's so low a percentage of people that have been diagnosed with narcissistic personality that will ever come near a therapist. And again, too, most of the people that do are the vulnerable narcissists. Which is that exactly the same as the covert, the inverted, the closet? I don't know anymore. Too many words. Oh, you're welcome, Carolyn. And I, I guess you know, I, I just would have. But maybe you don't have anything to share on the similarities that you see, or, or maybe an example of that between bipolar one and BPD. But I really probably should get more reading done on that. It's just that my understanding of bipolar is, you know, and the genesis of it. Not that they really can prove that either. But it seems to be, I mean, it's not called a personality disorder for what it's worth. So it seems to be really like schizophrenia and bipolar seem to be over there by themselves in terms of causation and treatment and um, what what they actually go through. And, and so I'm not saying there aren't any overlaps or similarities, 
But I really find it hard to believe that as many people as say they are or diagnosed get diagnosed as both. I think that's, you know, lousy diagnosing on the part of people that should know better because there's ways to ferret them. It could be difficult, but I don't, I, be, I don't believe in one is a differential diagnosis for the other. So I don't know where their psychiatry is at with that, but, um, so yeah, there are some treatments that have efficacy wheels if they'll seek treatment. And then of course it's a rough ride to work with them because whoa, they get angry a lot. They dump a lot. They, you know, um, they trans the transference, you know, is golden in therapy. So, but still, it means that I am often sitting on the other side of the screen, hearing a whole lot of like I'm being screamed at, like I'm, you know, I'm I'm representing the parent, object, parent, other. So, so I get it, right? And then it just depends if they can control that enough to where some of that might still happen, and I grant leeway to that, um, but if it, there's a line where it becomes too abusive. So it, you know, it's challenging that way. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm just looking at the time here. And I think too, that um, it, it's really important to just say again, that BPD is not NPD. And while there's some overlap, not, you know, it, it's just, they're not the same. But then again, when people are experiencing what they experience, I'm sure it's not the time to be parsing the differences. <clears throat> Michael, can you explain the difference in symptoms between dissociation from a traumatic marriage versus BPD? Can symptoms be similar? Um, hmm. I would say in a way they could be similar, but in another way they would probably differ in terms of severity and in terms of frequency. So, um, like, but that's hard to, to really measure. You said, um, the marriage was with a narcissist. Well, yeah, then it would depend on the, yeah, the level of trauma. Um, well, I think, I think the best answer to that probably is that they can be, it, it, the level of dissociation or the symptoms of it can be very similar as is seen in complex post-traumatic stress disorder. But again, trauma is what's driving that, but the driver of the trauma, there's still some delineation to be made there between the, so, so what I'm trying to say for people with CPTSD and to you, Michael, is that while it may look a lot like BPD, just rest assured, it's not exactly the same. And I'm not trying to take away anything from people suffering with CPTSD or any trauma response and dissociation after being traumatized by, by a narcissist, but it, it, it doesn't put you in the same category as them. So whether you're experiencing something that's very similar or almost the same as, uh, I don't know about narcissists and dissociation, but people with BPD and dissociation, it really is irrelevant because what's really important is what you are experiencing and hopefully the help you're getting for that and how you're learning to cope with that while you're in a recovery process. Because it is certainly like, you know, that's the other thing set out there in a couple of areas. People with BPD or narcissists don't infect you. They affect you. They traumatize you, but they don't infect you. So, you know, is that just semantics? I don't know. But I think it's important to say it's not contagious because what's really important for people, most of whom are, you know, have some codependency, is to know that you may have lost yourself and you're going through a lot now based on your own trauma response, but it doesn't make you a narcissist and it doesn't make people a borderline. And I think it's really important to say that. So there's a delineation there because, and I guess the major reason would be because people with BPD and a lot of people with NPD, the early stages of life where the trauma happens, not to say that that makes it, you know, it's not special or it's just different for what that means for people. So people with CPTSD, people with dissociative, you know, um, experiences and whatever's happening for you, Michael, with 
the trauma from the relationship from the narcissist that's that's still trauma response and that's still daunting and that's still a lot to go through but you will be able you know if if you're in good treatment you will be able to get through that and come back to yourself more and more whereas people with BPD and or NPD it's just that deeper underlying but I just want you know it doesn't really matter I just want to delineate that no matter how much one is suffering or how severe the dissociation or flashbacks after this these traumatic relationships it doesn't mean you're like them so that that's just an important distinguish distinguishing or dis, important to distinguish there you go wheels yeah i'm pretty sure she is malignant i don't think for a second psycho would ever get help well and even if she presented for help probably there'd be it wouldn't work it just wouldn't work because you know malignant i i don't know <laughs> I, I maybe need to go recheck, but I don't think that people who are pioneering in working with narcissists, I mean, people that aren't narcissists themselves, you know, or narcopaths, um, I don't think that they would probably work with, I, I don't know if they've ever worked with malignant narcissists versus, you know, narcissistic personalities who are not quite that deep, if that's the way I can put it. I don't know. So anyway, um, but, and I was just going to say too, that obviously punishment happens in many ways for people with BPD and relationships, um, after, you know, triggered, dysregulated emotion, etc. because during it, you're getting vicariously punished, which means you're absorbing the punishment. They're sh shooting out at you that belongs in effect belongs to someone else the reaction and the response belongs to someone else but that's really of little comfort if any probably none and the other thing is that um revenge you know you see punishment and revenge and smear campaigns for sure in bpd or npd and again differently motivated perhaps to different degrees but there's nothing that is you can't say that a bpd smear campaign is a you know, smear campaign light, so to speak. So that's another thing that, you know, in trying to distinguish, I don't think there's difference when people are going through it. But that is really, some people with BPD be lower percentage, but again, and a lot of people are very vengeful and very much punishing and very much, um, yeah, into, into vengeance, into vengeance for sure. And maybe they guise that, maybe they disguise that a bit, maybe it doesn't all come to the surface. And and by the way, I wasn't really like that. I mean, I think against my parents I wanted some punishment at a at a point in time. But um when I when I was really making my way through therapy and things were changing and I was evolving and I was growing and learning, um, I really didn't feel that way myself, you know, so like if somebody said to me now or even 25 or 30 years ago if you could do this to your mother and get away with it would you i'd say no because really in the end you know for people that are going to heal and recover from this it, it, i was always i mean i wasn't forgiving them every day that they were abusing me but when i got into therapy and, and got a little ways down through the process it was pretty clear to me that i needed to work on forgiveness not about them but for myself so that's a key thing too. People need to know that borderline abuse is real. Exploitation is real. Punishment and revenge is real. It's not every single person with BP will do this, but some will do it in a really dastardly kind of very covert exploitative way, punishing and or seeking vengeance and or just needing to come back and kind of like hit at you again because they need to feel better than you they need to feel like they won and 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 you know i learned early on in therapy that 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 bs that yes i had going on when i was way younger was like therapists were saying things that clicked with me instantly like well what are you fighting for and what do you think you're gaining out of that and we would really examine those things and the right fighting in bpd goes along with this too because for the 75% that were victimized, they carry that victim mindset forward and then they want other people to feel how they feel. And maybe they know that consciously, maybe they don't. 
but I knew myself that I wasn't interested in that because what good would it do me to make anybody feel as bad as I felt? Like I kind of caught that rather early on. And, um, even, even with like, I went no contact with the family of origin. So I wasn't hanging around to try to punish them or anything. Uh, so, so there's vast differences in people, but there are people that will, they, when they're right fighting, um, it's all over the fact that they were victimized and they're still in that victim mindset and they need help through therapy with that, but many won't go to therapy. And so they're still lashing out because they're saying, but what happened to me was unfair, which is true, but right fighting what was unfair from your childhood makes no sense in the here and now, right? So that's a lot of what drives um, punishment and revenge for, for a lot of people with BPD. And it's like they want to win. But what I learned early on in my recovery was that trying to win, you're just losing more. And it's like, so if you want to be righter than the person you're with or a friend, you lose the friend. And, if I, and you know, I had fear of abandonment up to a certain point, and then I worked through that. But so so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy that many with BPD don't realize, even though they were victimized, it's not okay to victimize others. And, um, yeah, when they punish or they exploit, they manipulate, they seek revenge, whether they know it or not, well, then they're pushing people away. And then when they push the person away, they don't get that part. And then they feel like the person abandoned them. So that, that gets into the whole poor me thing. And it has its genesis in the roots of what happened to them in childhood that was not their fault and should never have happened to them in childhood. But that's what has to, you know, as people become adults, that's what has to start to change. That's why it's so important to go to therapy because you can't walk around. Oh, they do. But it's, it's not healthy or reasonable at all to walk around thinking you're a victim of everybody because you're still reliving the victimization of your childhood. But but to go from one place to the other, people have got to go through as much treatment as it takes, and it usually isn't short term. Um, Will said, sometimes I daydream about getting up and kicking the crap out of my mom, but I doubt um, I would even if I could. Well, and you know, Wheels, I, you daydream about it, so I just want to add this in just from my experience many moons ago now. I always wanted, and when I say beat up, right, it's like, like what, 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 when I was a kid in the seventies, the sixties, if you fought with another kid and yeah, I did do some fighting, but I didn't start it. I was always just trying to protect myself because I just really wasn't like that. Um, and some people can be like that, but the point is, so when I was a kid and we would beat each other up or fight, like as soon as the other kid cried, that was it. You'd beaten them up and, and, and people would stop. Not like today. We're beating someone out, obviously, and even for kids, can mean something very much more vicious, right? Like a kid is on the ground, a kid is crying, a kid is hysterical, and the other person doesn't stop. So when I, th this is the, the framework I just want to give context to. I always wanted to sort of, quote, beat the shit out of my mother, beat her up. I wanted to beat another problem. <laughs> okay, cool. My wanting to beat my mother up meant I just really wanted to punch her a few times in the head and push her up against the wall. I didn't want to like annihilate her. But the thing is, so I, why I share that wheels is to say you, and, and maybe you are daydreaming and maybe that's what fits for you. But when I was experiencing these feelings, for me, it was a fantasy. I wanted to punch my mother's head in. That was the fantasy. And I never did it you know, nor would I ever do it. And, and, um, and so even back then, you know, I mean, the, I could have done it, my, but when my father was still alive, he would have killed me. That, that probably had some, you know, control factor on me, but I don't, it just wasn't my nature. So, and that's another thing I like to say for a lot of people that do have BPD, sometimes even under all the trauma, all the you know, acting out or acting in and all the triggered stuff that they don't know what it is. They really don't have a nature. In other words, if they could go to therapy and find their authentic self, it was never my nature to want to do that kind of stuff to people. I was always 
you know, what I, I hurt some people. Yeah. And, but, and, and sometimes I was misperceiving things when I had BPD, but I was definitely more often than not trying to defend myself either because when I was an adolescent, some kid hit me first or because, um, somebody would, you know, yell at me or whatever. And like, I'd be trying to defend myself, but still, you know, so I just feel blessed that I didn't feel like really hurting anybody else, you know? So I wonder if your daydream might be a fantasy because I had that fantasy probably until I was 30 and then maybe had the odd moment of it even a few years later, but I haven't had that for a long time because, you know, I'm just, there's just neutrality where my family of origin is concerned for me. Like, I don't feel negative. I don't feel positive. I don't think about it. I only mention it here to help other people. I don't think about it. It doesn't matter to me anymore. Um, and I forgave them and, you know, it, yeah, but where, from where you're at right now, wheels, I just want to say whether daydreaming or fantasy, it's healthy. It's really healthy. As long as you don't act on it, it's part of the rage. It's part of the anger. It's part of how unjust and, and, and just abhorrent the abuse is that we, we, we daydream or like you said, or I had the fantasy of wanting to hit back at her. It's interesting because I had the same kind of fantasy about my father at the time. And he was by far, um, I mean, physically abusive, sexually abusive, but my mother was probably even worse on the emotional abuse level, verbally abusive. They were equal, I think equally like awful. But so it's really healthy for people to feel anger. It's healthy for people to have fantasies of revenge, um, punishment, getting even, making them hurt. As long as you can, you know the difference clearly between the fantasy and not taking any action on it. Because I, I think that fantasy helped me get through a lot of things, but I was never going to act on it. So, um, yeah, it's important for people to think about that too. And, and that can be true for loved ones who've been really traumatized by somebody with BPD or NPD as well, or any relationship type that you get so reactive. You've been so traumatized. You just feel like belting them back. And then that, you know, that can, well, sometimes it happens with people, but, and that's not okay either, but you know, people have to get out of the situation and get into recovery. And the thing is too, that, um, Many people who are the exes of somebody with BPD or NPD or uh, family members, etc., they will have fantasies with their anger as well. It's it's a really healthy thing as long as one knows the difference between the daydream or the fantasy and and not taking action on it. Because I think it's really healthy for people to feel that, and I think I think that might have been played out in a few dreams I had a long, long time ago. Or, you know how dreams can be so screwy sometimes, and it's like, yeah, it's crazy what goes on in dreams. But it's it, it all has some kind of meaning, and it is, you know, the brain, the mind trying to work out stuff, make sense of stuff, I guess. But anyway, so yeah, I just think it was uh, important, this needed to be said. And again, um, I hope it helps people. I hope it validates people. And for people with BPD that might think, oh my God, you know, this is horribly stigmatizing. Um, I'm not talking about everybody with BPD. And if you have BPD and you're listening back to this or you see the title and you come to listen, just know if you're not somebody who's seeking punishment and revenge and you're aware that you're not and you don't exploit people, then I'm not talking about you, right? So categorically, not all people with BPD are the same. And Wheel said, I think it comes from the physical torture she inflicted on me for years. Well, yes, it definitely would. Um, I recently realized that some of what I went through is probably considered physical abuse. I fantasize about making her hurt. Well, like I said, Wheel's healthy to fantasize about making her hurt. I feel the same level of helplessness I've had to feel. Yes. And, you know, I think... I think you're like I, like I was in the sense that, you know, you're not going to do it, but it's healthy to fantasize about it. And, and where the danger comes in for some people is when they can't tell the difference between their fantasy, they act on the fantasy, right? 
Um, because then unfortunately, if you attack an abuser, you're still going to end up in jail for assault or whatever, because unless they're in the act of abusing you and, and it was self-defense, but, um, Kirsty, I'm diagnosed BPD, but have quiet version. Um, it's hard to get therapy and give when I can't express my own feeling and even recognize and put, yeah, put words to them, to, to your feelings. Yeah, no, I really hear you. And, um, yeah, it, it, well, and I wonder, so you got diagnosed with BPD at least, because a lot of people with quiet BPD can have trouble getting diagnosed, which I mean, the label's no fun, but understanding, you know, t take away from the label, you know, what it really means for what you're going through and what you need to work on and heal. But um, I wonder if that's why it's hard to get therapy, because um, maybe people haven't recognized or haven't been um, attuned or expert enough that what, what quiet BPD is. Because I know I, I work with and I have worked with many clients with quiet BPD, and it is very different. And maybe some therapists didn't know what it was or what, what was wrong, or maybe they didn't understand how to deal with that because it because it is very very different you know it's like i've had sessions with clients where it, it like i don't know in an hour if i ask like 80 questions or something you know and then um because because i might get a one or two word answer or i might not get an answer at all so and then i found some other methods and ways to try to say a little less and give people room to just sit be there and feel and, and 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 that's the thing too is to work with people with quiet bpd about feelings to do some psychoeducational work around what are feelings and how to identify feelings because i know i i wasn't quite but i know exactly what you're saying from working with clients and and whether people have quiet bpd or externalizing acting out bpd that that tends to be in two very different presentation styles a similar core issue for people with BPD is that you think that the person that is yelling and screaming knows exactly what they feel, but they often don't either. They might feel like, I'm really pissed, I'm really mad, but they don't know what's behind it. So a big part of working with people with BPD is helping them to, you know, look like, like DBT calls it the chain analysis of behavior, but it can be done in all modalities, cognitive behavioral therapy, etc to, you know, what was the event? What was the reaction? What happened? What, you know, breaking it all down. But so it'd be a little different when working with people with quad BPD because it's like, it's so all internalized that, and it happens so quickly and you withdraw and then you don't know what you're feeling. And I think that's when people, you know, therapists really need to understand that to be able to help people through educating them on how to get in touch with feelings. And also, not taking offense or feeling like they're not helping enough when people aren't really that responsive back sometimes. Um, Carolyn, um, I've seen people from different cultures try to pull the eyes out of their parents, Indian. However, working with them up close and personal, they are humble and pleasant. Well, sounds like I, do, I don't know. I mean, obviously that might be something cultural. And aside from that too, um, they, they, I guess, didn't have any discernment between a fantasy or a want for that and doing it. But, but it, it could be more that it's cultural. I don't know. Cause I haven't really encountered anybody, um, who's ever described anything like that. So, um, yeah, well, it might, it must be cultural. Um, and wheels, is it normal to still feel phantom pains, traumatizing injuries sometimes, even though it's long since healed? Um, are you talking about psychologically versus physically? Um, it's a little confusing, but I think, um, put it this way, you can heal a lot of pain. Um, oh, thank you, Carolyn. Um, cause, cause yeah, it must be, you know, I, I haven't heard of that. Um, and well, sometimes you can heal a piece of pain, if that makes sense, like a part of something, 
but there's still a lot of other pieces of what that trauma is about. So, so when you heal something, it's hard to tell in the middle of the process, but to a degree, I have clients recognize, I can see when clients are working through something and something has been healed. And then there's the next piece, the next part, the next. And so you can heal something and then be feeling another moving piece of the trauma, if that makes any sense. So, and, and because when something's really healed, then it doesn't usually still cause pain. Um, but the overall situation, there could still be grief about. But so I would think it means that you've healed something, but it's a piece, right? And there's more pieces to go. And, and the best example I could give is, you know, like I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing great in my life. Family of origin, past is in the past, all that wonderful stuff. But there's one thing I know that's waiting for me, and that's if my mother ever can manage to to go off to you know to pass away, and I don't wish it on her, but it's just my it is my own self interest when I say this that when she does pass away, I know there's going to be another little piece to do. I didn't have much of anything to do when my father passed away because it was like it made me happy. I just at the time he actually died, and I didn't find out for eight months. I felt freer in the world, didn't even know he died because there was no connection. Because I'm pretty intuitive. Like, if somebody I care about is in trouble, I usually send something's wrong. But he went and died, and I didn't have a clue. Didn't know for eight months. And the grief, yeah, well, no, I don't feel shame or embarrassment anymore. But I guess, you know, I used to. But the grief that I felt for him was, I think I grieved so much during my life, all he did to me, etc., and who he really wasn't. I didn't have much grief when he died, but the mother, I just want to say with mothers, it doesn't, and this is another thing I heard somebody say out there, oh, good God, it doesn't matter if you are male or female, the deepest wound that can, can happen to a child is the a wound from mother. Fathers can really hurt kids too, but, but the deepest work in healing and recovery is going to always be the mother work. And so I know I have one piece waiting for me when she passes away, because I was thinking about that the other day, as I was wondering what that pain was that I talked about in the live stream, right? But like, I think I, I know what it is and it's come and gone and it's mostly gone now. But the thing is, um, there's an element of something with her that like, I know when my mother passes away, I don't even know if they'll tell me or whatever, but, um, or if I would know otherwise, but like, I know there will be something come up that didn't come up when my father died, which is just going to be, I don't expect it to be primal as in, oh my God, I'm going to be back to feeling like I'm an infant. No, but it is going to be another piece of grief of just everything else I've healed already, for lack of a better way to put it, you know? I accept everything that happened, happened. I accepted that she, I accept she hates me. I accept she could never love me. I know she never loved me. Um, and, but yeah, then I have this memory of the last time I saw her, which is probably 2004. Cause even though we were no contact, there was this one time we met because it was after, well, it was long after she told me about my father's death, but for some reason we did meet at a mall and had lunch. I couldn't even swallow because um, nothing fell. It was just anxiety producing. And um, and then what happened after that was awful. Like she was, because this is what my parents were like, right? Devoid of emotion, abusive as hell. But they were always, you know, material things were like drop in the bucket. It was like, here, have this, have this, have this, buying stuff. And that was the currency of, quote, love, unquote. And I always hated that. That's why I've never been money hungry in my life. I had to create a whole new relationship financially with money because I was so like the opposite. And the thing is, I probably still am a little bit, but so I remember the point at which lunch was over and, and I knew it was going to be the last time I ever saw her and, and weird reason why we got together that day. And then, um, she was still living in the same city I was though. And, um, so after that, lunch was over. I just thought we would part ways and we're walking around the mall. And she's like, do you want, like, could I buy you a book? Could I buy you some books? You want to go into the bookstore? 
Um, we did that. It felt uncomfortable. Um, and then I was aware of the duality of the moment. You know, there was something in her happening and, the, and I don't know what or how, and there was something in me happening and I was still my age and everything, but I could feel my inner child that's integrated with me. I could feel it inside my gut that it was like, man, this hurts, you know, um, because she's doing, she's using the currency of buying stuff again to try to demonstrate something or whatever before we part. Cause this is it. Like we, we were only together for like two hours that day tops. And so it was like, so we went to the bookstore and all that, and that was kind of uncomfortable. And then we went into some other store and it was limited to stores in the mall, but long story short, then she was like getting really desperate to keep buying me stuff. And I knew what that meant. And it was, ugh. and and so then we were inside. I don't even know what kind of store it was. And she's buying me a pasta pot. I'm like, no, no, really? No. She buys me this big pasta pot. I don't know, some kind of barbecue things and some other stuff. I don't even remember what it all was now. And, um, and so I'm, and then there was one more big store to go in and through and she bought some stuff and I really didn't want it. And I'm like, but this person is out of control. I don't know what's going on with her. And so I just had the bags and everything. I said, thank you. And, but the pain that I was feeling then was the knowing that this was it and it wasn't much and it was old and etc. So the thing is when we finally, we ran out of stores to go to and I couldn't take much more anyways, I wanted to go home and I was hurting and I knew I needed to cry and I wasn't going to do that around her. And she would not, you know, feel, I don't know what she was feeling or what was it. She was feeling something or something was happening, but not a very emotional person. So then we each went and, called different taxi lines you know we were going two different directions and when we were, we were standing outside waiting for those cabs I just remembered this now I don't usually think about it but man it was an emotional moment for me inside and she looked like she was having her own struggle however we would describe that uh, I don't think it does it didn't I didn't know how to make it mean anything at the time and then um, she was wanting me to go first. And I was like praying to God that her cab came first. Because I have my own sentimentality about things, right? And I wanted to watch her go away. I didn't want to be the one that went away, if that makes any sense. So her cab did come first. And she gave me that cold, not really hug hug. And then got in the cab. And as she, as the cab went away and she waved, and then the tears just started pouring out of my eyes. I wasn't like actively crying, crying, but tears just started rolling down my eyes. And then my cab came along and then I got in the back of the cab and I said, hi, and where I was going. And then I started bawling hard. I said, don't mind me. I'm fine. And, you know, cause, cause it was her desperation with all of it. But anyway, that, that just came up because when I think about what it will be like, when she passes away and that that little piece, well, it, it's an important piece of deeper work. It might take me a month or so. I'm, you know, I don't think it's going to take a long time, but it's going to, it's going to hurt. And I think, I think back to that day and it informs me that there's something there that I still feel, even though I've healed all I can heal, but it's okay that I feel it, if that makes sense. And, um, DB, somatic pain, I experienced this psychologically and physically following a car accident, past physical pain and past traumas. Well, that's what I was describing. I don't know if you were on that live stream, but when I alluded to it, I was feeling it. I was being with it. I don't have it now. Um, it comes and goes a little. And I, I had a couple other things, you know, just, just things in life you have to deal with. Right. And I was thinking, well, it could be that because. I made some changes in my life that are exciting and change so can be a little stressful, um, but exciting. And so I thought, is it that or is it this? And I, I don't know, because I think it's a little bit the world situation at times. And I think the rest of it does belong with my mother in the sense that I have a sense she could even be gone for all I know. I don't really know if I would know. I knew when my grandmother passed away, I knew instantly because there was a connection there, even though she was a borderline abuser too, but she was also sometimes fun. So intermittent reinforcement. But the thing is, so I wonder, and I don't know, and it, but 
I just know that if I got the news tomorrow and she's gone, actually, she told me I'd know how she was gone. She said to me that when money shows up in your bank, you'll know I'm dead. Man, that hurt too, because, you know, that's not the way you want to find something like that out. So what, I'm going to go to, go check my bank balance online one day and it's going to be way bigger or not. Um, and, and I'll know she's dead. Oh, okay. But anyway, my whole point is we have to do all the work all the way in pieces. And in this situation I'm in, which maybe other people are in as well, for sure. I'm just very aware. So I've been pre grieving it, pre dealing with it. And when I think about that mall moment, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be like that. And maybe just a little bit more. Um, and mother, mother wounds, mother work is always deeper. Anyway, could have made that shorter. Couldn't I have? Um, and, and what I was describing by the way, DB was, um, it, it definitely is pain moving through me. And, and I think it's tied to my mother. And in, in regard to the fact that I've healed everything else, I mean, nobody's perfect. But when it moves through me, it's, it's, yes, it's likely still been housed in my body, but it really comes up a certain track and it really, within a, a period of hours to a day, really comes up. Now I got a little bit in the middle of my throat now, but, but it will come up, go to the throat and right out, you know, so it's about clearing things out. And we all said, sometimes I feel the scar I mentioned last week, the scar used to be, um, a hole in my back and I can almost oh so you are talking physically um i can almost feel the pain all over again when i think about it not quite but almost well yes that 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 makes sense and that could be phantom pain and and i didn't mean to say that somebody couldn't feel because maybe what i'm describing is phantom emotional pain in a sense for a connection that was never there but i hear you wheels and i yes i think that that was a good way that you described it. And that's what you're experiencing. That's how you described it. So that's what matters most. And I just want to validate that for you. Um, Carolyn, uh, betrayal by a quote, parent unquote, is beyond understanding for a child. Been there. Yes, well put. Would you mind touching on this? We were thrown out on the streets at 13. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that because Wow. You know, for all the, see, and I, and I always want to make this clear when I'm sharing stuff to just, you know, help and whatnot with people, I, I know that people have had it worse than me. And Carolyn, I feel for you because I couldn't imagine that as much as I did go through, that didn't happen to me. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, that is, I mean, that's not just an abandonment wound. That's, I mean, psychologically, that's a literal abandonment. And that is so traumatizing. I, I'm so sorry to hear that you went through that. I, I can't imagine what that would have been like. Because it, it's beyond betrayal, isn't it? And um, touching on it. Well, I mean, I, I honestly just feel so much for you. I really don't know what to say. Because I know as bad as I had it, no nobody threw me out of the house. I, I wouldn't have known what to do with myself. I can't imagine. I'm so sorry. I wish there was something wiser I could say, except that, by God, you made it through, Carolyn. You know, but I I don't know, you know, how you managed at that point in time. And, um, yeah, I'm just so sorry to hear that happen because I really, um, really, really am speechless to hear that. I'm, I'm just sorry. I don't have anything else. You know, no, no bag of tricks of wisdom and, um, just really feel for you on that. Uh, DB, the insurance company said the physical pain was all in my head. Doesn't matter. I still experienced it as pain. Pain is pain. Well, yes. And, um, trauma can leave a lot of pain in the body for sure. And in many different ways and in autoimmune diseases and other things. And so that's, uh, but insurance companies, yeah, that's what they're good for. I mean, I, I and this is a, this is a terrible thing. I'll just make it brief. This is why I don't have pet insurance, because it's like all insurance. I had you know something happen with tenants insurance before, and they were like, no, we don't cover that. It's like you pay and you pay and you pay and you pay, and when you need it, they're like, no, sorry, we don't cover that. 
or we don't hear you, or yeah, it's got to be in your head. Carolyn, I call them parents without a conscience. Sure sounds like they were, Carolyn. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I can't, not that it's important because I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, um, my parents were so freaking abusive and weird and pretty horrible emotionally and physically and verbally and psychologically. And yet they provided everything else. I know they, they never even did so much as like in terms of this materialistic ridiculousness where they were somehow conscientious or something. Um, even when I left home at 17, like um, I had a bike and stuff left there and they sold it and they sent me the money. It's like weird. So, you know, um, your parents, you know, if, if you know that they were or you identify them as narciss narcissists, it sounds like there might have been malignant narcissist psychopathy in there because that's just, yes, without a conscience indeed. Again, I'm just so sorry because, you know, on top of everything else that you would go through, and I know what I went through, if that had happened to me on top of it all, I don't know what, uh, you know, wow, I'm so sorry. Rebecca, my partner has BPD and unfortunately I know he won't do anything to change it. The undeserved entitlement he has is astounding. There is just not enough room in this relationship for both of us. Well, I like the way you put that, and I'm sure that as much as you know that now, it it's still not, you know, it's still painful to leave and to end it. But if you haven't done that yet, hopefully you're going to be doing that for yourself as soon as you can, because I, I think that's a great way to describe it. There is enough room for both of you there, because... Yes, it's all about them. And, and even with people with BPD, it can be so all about them. Uh, Wheels, I was dealing with that trauma anniversary the night I mentioned it. Oh, okay, I remember that. I could almost feel the pain again. It hit me really hard emotionally. I think it was the first time I really acknowledged that trauma. Well, that makes a lot of sense, Wheels. The survivor guilt from that has tormented me for years. But I never really acknowledged how much that affected me. I don't even know if it makes sense. It, it, if that, yes, it does. You're making wheels. You're always making perfect sense. You're just doubting yourself because of the trauma and you know still being actively gaslit. But you make tremendous sense, and I'm so sorry that happened to you. And um, when you mentioned the, that last live stream, or not the last one, but the last one you were at, that was the anniversary of that. I didn't have any idea what you were talking about, but I'm so sorry. And um, and yes, it sounds like you really were processing it, maybe not for the first time or for the first time, but certainly more deeply, right? Because that would have been, you know, sometimes things are so traumatizing that it just stays frozen there for quite a while after or even years after. So you really are um, in in the depth of a lot of things there, Wheels, and I think that you're doing astoundingly well, given what you have, what you are going through, and what you are um, working to heal. Kirsty, have some experience when somebody is healing, derealization, depersonalization. If it was chronic every day, ten to fifteen years, is it possible um, to outcome experience? Okay, let me see. Um, Oh, if you're working to heal that, I think you're asking if it's possible to actually do that and have a good outcome. Um, I think the answer is yes. And I think that with that, um, you know, depending on what the trauma was and what you know or don't know about it, maybe EMDR would re be really helpful for that if, if you're not in some kind of treatment right now. Um, but yes, I think it is possible to heal that, but you do have to process and maybe learn more about it. I don't know where you're at in, in your journey. Um, but can I just say when I had BPD way back, you know, like they told me in 1975, labeled me, didn't bother to assess me. Um, I experienced, and, and they put it on my chart and I saw the words too. I didn't know what they meant. But they wrote down that I was having a lot of derealization and depersonalization. And then I would later learn and understand what the experience meant and derealization, depersonalization, and dissociation. 
And I know that now they've got derealization, depersonalization in axis one dissociative disorder. But the thing is, yes, you can heal that. And it's very trauma based. And so it's about sometimes it's about processing more of what that trauma was. It's about many other moving pieces of recovery, but EMDR might really be helpful for that as well. Depending what you've done, I don't know because I don't know you. And so I think, um, but yes, even after it being chronic every day for 10 to 15 years, the hope would be first reducing that, right? That's why EMDR might be really helpful for you to start reducing that response and then in, in EMDR and or any other modality to learn how to cope with that more effectively because there is a way to actually become more aware, to learn how to ground faster, etc., so that you won't be going through. I hope you're not going through that still every day. But yes, but but if you're not in therapy, it would be really helpful to seek out someone to help you more with that. Um, Carolyn, thank you for your transparency, AJ. Oh, you're very welcome, and thank you for yours. Um, DB, uh, Carolyn, yes, betrayal of a parent is beyond understanding for an adult, too. Oh, good point. I believe I was in my late 30s before my mother would validate a painful truth for me. Still blows me away, the betrayal. Yeah. Rebecca, all of his actions, reactions, are emotional driven. He gets so hysterical when he feels any sense of abandonment that he becomes dangerous in his mission to resolve the pain. He is also an addict. Well, yeah, and if you're not away from him yet, I hope you will be soon because that's dangerous. And, you know, I mean, when there's addiction involved as well, you know, talk about no impulse control, let alone poor impulse control. Hey there, Deborah. I have um, deep mother wounds. My mother has had deep mother wounds. Yeah, well, I could say the same for mine, too. Yes, that's the way it goes, unfortunately. He said, from her own mother, and my daughter has deep mother wounds from me. This generational woundedness, it's frustrating because it seems we could not break the pattern in this lifetime. Well, yes, and again, you know, you need to work on radical acceptance and whatever, wherever you're at with, you know, your mother wound from your mother. And then you have to also do the same for, you know, that your daughter got wounded because it's tragic, you know, and it happens because people, you know, when, when you have kids and, you know, like there was a point in my life where I could have had a kid because I, I was fine then but by then it, I didn't want to, but I definitely knew I, I wasn't going to, and, and not everybody has the luxury of this, or sometimes kids come along or people don't realize, but, but I knew darn well that I wasn't going to have a kid if I was going to like in any way, have it go through anything near what I went through. But, but I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong. Like I'm not, no blame or fault or judgment because you had a daughter, Deborah, please know that. Carolyn, for me, the sexual abuse of my brother uh, was what broke me. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. God, you know, my, my brother, the golden child was a creep and is a narc, but he wasn't one of my abusers in that regard. And he never did get to punch my head in. No matter how many times he tried, I outsmarted him. But I'm so sorry um, to hear that because again, you know, <laughs> It's 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 really horrible when it comes from a parent, and I can't imagine what it's like when it comes from a sibling. I'm I'm sure it's it, it's got to be maybe even worse. I don't know, but I'm so sorry to hear that it broke you in that regard because, I mean, there's many ways we can break, and um, and and maybe it feels like it's a complete break, or maybe it is the break that those of us that survive and go through the healing and then thrive um it's maybe as we're broken is the start of a long long painful journey that we shouldn't have to take to uh it being a breaking open you know to heal but like not not as a result of what he did there at all i'm so sorry to hear that um wheels i'm so yeah you saying you're sorry to karen too yes Everybody deserves much better. Um, 
Anthony, we deserve an empowering and peaceful life. Yes. And look at what the uh, narcopaths are doing to our world. Hmm? Um, Anthony said, these lurkers trouble me, though. Oh, you mean like how many people are here versus how many people are taking part? Is that what you mean? Um, our dynamic. What a cool name. I had to break off a relationship with a person suffering from BPD. I really tried and tried, but I couldn't stand the emotional abuse anymore. An extremely self-centered human being. Yes, and um, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, all you went through, and I'm sure that, you know, you tried and tried, and but like I've said, even a perfect person can't change and fix them or rescue them, but people, unfortunately, have to find that out in a really hard, painful way. Um, Anthony, how long did it take for you to realize that, um, R? Oh, good question. Uh, Rebecca, yes, I will leave him. It saddens me greatly to see him go through his own emotional torment, let alone when he has to attack me because he can't deal with his emotions on his own. Um, yep, but, you, you know, I would just say, so you have empathy for him and compassion, but it's really time to kind of detach from that and give the empathy and the compassion to yourself. Um, because, you know, it's terrible that he is in that state, but if he doesn't reach out for, out for help, I mean, ultimately no choice is a choice on his part and you need to really start stepping away, you know, psychologically and emotionally from the fact that he is not your responsibility. It's not your fault and you can't fix it. Anthony, um, it seems to me there are not many well-adjusted people in this world. It's sad. I see it too much. Well, I mean, I don't know what the ratios would be, but I guess, you know, there's some, there's, there's, a, you know, an amount of adjust, well-adjusted people, but I think we're at a time in the world where there's more people that, you know, have had trauma in their childhoods and not. And what, what that all means when they grow up and get different diagnoses, but it's still the base trauma, but it definitely means people shouldn't be close to them or in relationships with them. Um, Rebecca, no amount of reassurance will ever be enough, and it has been hard to accept this. Well, yeah, and, and no doubt you gave a ton. And I'm just sorry to hear that. You know, you must have been hanging in for a while. You must have thought it might, you know, that maybe it would change. and. And now I guess is the painful realization that, you know, doesn't matter what you do. Our dynamic said, I knew from November of last year and then I left. Um, but then in May of this year, I gave him another chance after an apology. And the same BS came back two or three months later. Yeah, I swear to hear that because that, that invariably does happen. And then you said, I said what? I had to say that I needed a break and now the rage begins with no contact response treatment. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. It's really tough stuff, but um, yeah, you need to turn that break into just totally going forward and not looking back and not trying to talk and not trying to explain it if you can't, if, if, if that's possible. Um, Wheels, AJ, thank you for that. It's nice to know someone thinks I'm making sense. Oh, yes, Wheels, you are always making sense. Trust me. Nothing makes sense around me. I feel like a freaking nut. Well, you know what? This will be a weird sentence, but it's normal to feel like a freaking nut when you're being abused by a freaking nut. You know, because it's, you know, and, and when you were younger, it was like internalized that you were bad. You know, the shame wound and that it was your fault. But you're not the nut. She's a nut. And, and you're not bad. And you're always making perfect sense wheels. So, um, yeah. Hopefully, maybe you can believe in that. Continue to work on your trust for you and what you know. And you're right on the money with it all. You you definitely are. Our dynamic. He admitted to two weeks ago he needed therapy. But he never followed up and ignored me when I asked about following through. Well, and that admission might have been just so you wouldn't leave. And the other thing, as I've said in a video recently, that just needed to be outright said is, even if he goes to therapy tomorrow, it's too late. You know, you've accrued too much damage, and he needs years. 
and you would just be going through more and more and more of the same. So I hope you realize that for yourself, that even if you go to therapy, it it is a dauntingly long and involved process, and you'd have to really be wanting to do it for himself. It can save your relationship now. So I hope that you um, can hear that so you can save yourself hanging around any longer in case he goes, I, I made an appointment. So what? You know, it's it's probably too late. Or I think I would word it our dynamic that you really need to ensure for yourself that it's too late. Uh, DB um, to Deborah C. Same. Learn behaviors. I thought I was an awesome parent compared to how my parents were with me. Was completely shocked to learn the truth, but I had no context within a larger world. Well, and that's that's true, you know, like people do the best they can, even if it might not be like that successful, but you're trying your best. And then like Maya Angelou, that quote says, when we know better, we do better and can't do better till we know better. Wheels, during lockdown, I started to realize how many traumas I've had that I just never acknowledged in any meaningful way. I'd um, always go through these traumatic events and then uh, have to go on like nothing happened. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, and you know, that is, um, well, it can be some dissociation, but it's repression, right? And repressing trauma, I mean, that it's always going to come out sideways. And of course, it's it's always waiting to be acknowledged. Um, our dynamic, thank you. Um, the form is very helpful. I decided to not look back. Good for you. I'm sure it's not easy. I'm sure it's painful. But just know you're doing what you need to do. And you're doing what's healthiest for you. And it will get better, you know, as you work through whatever healing um, process you need. And time alone doesn't heal at all, but time helps, you know. And uh, and, and the, the key thing now is to work on where you're focusing because a lot of people find it difficult to stop obsessively thinking about and ruminating <clears throat> about this, whole, this poor, helpless person, which is really the state they're often in, but it's up to the poor, helpless person to find their way to some help. So... Um, and and sadly, some people never figure that out, which is a tragedy for sure. So, um, but nice to see some new people on the stream. And um, thank you guys for all you shared and supporting each other and your questions. And uh, I'm just looking at time. I got to get going here. It's been a pleasure and um, look forward to the next live stream. And uh, I hope that I said enough about the topic so that all the rest of which everything that people had to share is fine and important, too. So hopefully people will, you know, when, when people come on live streams like this, I just want to say I really appreciate. And, and some people are just listening and that's fine, too. But I really appreciate your sharing, your participation, because, you know, you, hopefully you get some help here, too, and support. But you're going to help other people. You know, so I, I, I've heard from a lot of people who say they watch or listen to this live stream or the next live stream because they're up all night and they're in a bad way. And it's not always going to be just something I said. It's going to be things that other people shared, too. So just know that you're really a part of something here that will help others. So I think it's important that you know that. Um, Anthony, um to die thinking it was your fault, that is definitely a tragedy. Well, yes. And Anthony, thanks for the podcast. Yeah, it becomes a podcast because they don't have the camera on, right? I just like to do that because I'm looking into a camera all day with clients. I get a sore neck and this way I can just recline and it's comfy. And hey, I can't see you guys either. <laughs> anyway, um, he said, this was great. I'm, I'm glad you think so, Anthony. And I'm, I, happy to do it and always enjoy streams and and really sorry for you know like carolyn and some others and the pain that people are you know have either been through and like what wheels has been through and is going through and our dynamic and others and db it's like but you know i'm glad that you feel safe here to share and and again i just want to remind you so hopefully it's helpful to you and you're supporting each other as well and you're going to help other people when they're when they hit desperation places and find my dinky little channel 
I'm listening to live streams in the middle of the night that many, many people have emailed me over the years. They say saved their life. So how important is that, right? How sacred is that? And, um, and I'm not taking credit for, you know, saving someone's life, but, but if the live stream is, if it be in there and people sharing, et cetera, and maybe something I said as well, that whole aggregate there of everything, um, it can help people to get through dark nights to start again in the morning. Um, oh, thank you, GB. You're very welcome. Chu Bang Boon. Oh, you're welcome too. Um, and Carolyn, you're welcome too. And God bless you as well. God, God bless everyone if people aren't offended by that. And um, you're welcome, Rebecca. And um, yeah, Wheel said, don't forget to like the stream. Yes, because we have a resurgence here. I shouldn't say anything. I know exactly who it is. I know where it's coming from. Shame on them. But yes, there's a new little stream of some thumbing down which my just saying that might make it worse, but like, oh, wow, I think I'll survive it. Ha ha. Anyway, who cares? People got to do what depraved people got to do. So for all kinds of reasons. Anyway. Um, oh, Kirsty, you're very welcome. I'm glad it was helpful. And, um, and I hope other people contributed to that for you too, as well. So everybody take care and look forward to next time. And, um, I don't know. I'm thinking some night. I'm I'm not really. I'm a spontaneous comedian, but some night it would be nice to do a stream that was just light. Maybe I don't know. Maybe people would like that too. Um. Anyway, everybody take care. And I, I'm gonna try to watch how I end this now because I notice I cut myself off. But actually, by the time I hit stop, I'm not talking anymore. Oh, I know what it is. It's that friggin' five to ten second delay. Oh, this is awkward. So now I will be saying good night, peace out. Okay, I have to say two things. I'm going to say that and mean it, and I'm done, and I'm going to hit the button, and then there's going to be a 10-second lag, but maybe this way i got to try it and see if I don't cut myself off in the middle of a sentence, okay? So, peace out.